Thanks for tuning in. After a week-long hiatus, we are back. It is December 19th, 2012. We're here for our 24th episode. We got a shitload of stuff to break down for you tonight. We have UFC 155. Our, I'm sorry, uh, UFC on Fox 5. Way to start back from the break. UFC on Fox 5. <laughs> we saw Ben Henderson defend his lightweight crown. Uh, we had UFC on FX. The Tough Smashes finale. Ross Pearson getting a win against George Sotaropoulos. And we have the Tough finale, Nelson vs. Mitrium. Three cards to bring you. Obviously, we have a bunch of news to bring you as well, because it's been two weeks since our last show. Uh, so it's good as fuck to be back. And uh, without any further ado, let's get right to it. And we are back. We're very happy to be back. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and and before we do get on the, the road with the podcast and start breaking down those three cards and all the UFC news, uh, we just want to dedicate this episode to, to everybody over in Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, that horrible, horrible shooting that went down at Sandy Hook Elementary School. The the most heinous crime I've I've ever been alive for, probably anyone's ever been alive for. Uh, just uh, really horrible. You know, there's there's nothing we can do or say to to give it any sort of justice. So uh, yeah, you know, hope hopefully this uh, podcast can can if anything just just be a, a little bit of a distraction and and put things in uh, put put things in in perspective. Um, and you know, if you have a loved one, whether you've talked to him recently or not, you know, just just give him a call and tell you you uh, love him. You know, it's a uh, it's a fragile thing. This this thing called life, and uh, you know, you really gotta a- appreciate those those close to you. And uh, you know, we'll move on, offer a little bit of a uh, distraction from from everything. But uh, I love you, know, you I f- Jake. I love you too, bro. Um, and uh yeah it would it would just just be remiss if 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 we went along and didn't say anything i was thinking whether or not i wanted to bring it up at all but uh no our uh our our episode tonight is dedicated to to the families and the victims and that uh horrible horrible um incident and uh yeah our uh, thoughts are really with with everyone over in Newtown Connecticut but as we said we'll try and be a distraction be uh, funny you know talk about MMA to do what what we usually try to do um you have any <coughs> trying to segue from that horrible thing I'll try and bring it bring it back out of the ashes you uh do anything fun in the last couple weeks we had a week off it was it was all because of me too it, you know Chris was down to do uh Wednesday but just most of the technical technical things go down on my end and I was driving from Chicago to Florida uh to 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 graduate I graduated this past Saturday which was pretty cool um yeah do you uh do anything fun on 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 your week off Chris Boom! Bang! Wow! Powerful, Jake Walters. Powerful. No, that was uh, that was uh, that was very touching, man. Very well put. Thanks, um, man. And uh, as far as fun, you know, man, I've just been doing the same shit. You know, I got a I got a hole in my face where a tooth used to be. You know, and uh, just working like a fucking slave. And uh, but I, I'm I'm enjoying it, man. I'm alive. Life could be worse. And uh, you know, just coming up with a couple things, this podcast, you know, an idea for a cartoon. So it's it's been a very productive and. Uh, at least um, a, a decently happy time for me. Thank you, sir. Dude, I'm looking forward to to the Condor, and once that starts to uh, really, really get get wheels under it, you know we'll we'll be pushing the hell out of it on the show. Uh, we'll go go through everything. Uh, if you would like to call in and chat about anything, the number's up on our Ustream. But uh, just in case you want to jot it down, you're listening to an archive version. The call in number is two one three. Four five seven three three eight zero. We're live every Wednesday, nine to eleven Eastern, six to eight Pacific. We usually go further than the two hours. Um, our Nate Quarry episode, I, I think we went four hours and eight minutes. And uh, in case you were wondering, the last half hour or so of that show, I was belligerently wasted. Lit. <laughs> I was lit up. I was slurring. Dude, Think- he was lit up like Manny Pacquiao against Marquez on their fourth Dude. fight. <laughs> I was 
lit up like the Christmas tree in fucking Central Park. It was, it was a uh, sloppy, sloppy night. You know, it was like hour three in in, in the podcast. I was just like, this is this is fucking horrible. I fucking need a drink. And I, you know, text text Ram or I typed into a Ramses, and he and Miller were were called in. And I I told him, hey, I got to piss. And I pissed, poured myself a strong drink, and uh, proceeded to get absolutely hammered. So, uh, if you could not understand what I was saying, that's what went down. But usually, uh... You know, I was gonna say, dude, it's really hard. I don't know if people know, man. It's hard to talk more than two hours basically straight. I mean, we're alternating. But at the end of the day, talking for two hours, it's tiring, man. I've done two podcasts in a day when I guest hosted Joe show, and I was just run down by the end of yeah. ours. You know, I could barely even make it. So, uh, you yeah. know, even though you were wasted, you, it was a strong effort. Strong effort, powerful Jake Walters. Uh, looks like our you streams <clears throat> flickering in and out. Um, but uh, if you're listening on iTunes, you probably don't give a shit. Uh, I know my internet's going fine because I can hear you crystal clear. Um, and yeah, l- like I was mentioning, our call-in number is two one three four five seven thirty three eighty. I uh, listen to this show nine to eleven Eastern MMA Roundtable every Thursday seven to nine Eastern four to six Pacific. Uh, we usually try and tack that down to two hours because our buddy Ray <clears throat> does that from midnight to two a.m. He's a single father, so uh, much props to him for giving his time for the round table. And um, I don't know why I broke. That probably sounded incredibly that was fucking really stupid. Weird. <laughs> that was me trying to sound slick and just sounding absolutely retarded. That was that was in a moment my entire dating history. Me just like, oh hey, this will this will be cool. This will be slick. And nope, this comes out like I'm an autistic person. Um, hey, let me get inside. <laughs> and as always, huge thank or huge shout out to our partners, MMA Mental, uh, Rain Patrick. Do it big. We. Uh, we were just talking about their uh, episode this week. I uh, didn't see who 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 they had on. It was Ryan Jimmo and someone else. Ryan Jimmo and Mike Wilkinson from uh, Tough Smashes, I believe. That is that's awesome. And yeah, check them out at MMAMental.com. Uh, listen to their podcast. Ray, the dapper dapper gentleman from the UK, and Patrick. Uh, he he has the best radio voice of anyone on the fucking radio. He's always talking like this, and he does it naturally. So you know, it's not one of those fake contrived radio voices. He has a true radio voice, and, uh, and he's one of the nicest guys we've ever potted with, bar none. Yeah, yeah, he's. He is a uh, sweetheart. P fucking money. Um, so yeah, I, I uh, guess what have we just been spouting off for eight minutes here yeah, without we doing it? We yeah, haven't no, said like a single word. All right. Um, yeah, let's let, let's get us uh, straight to um, to the the card we that happened right after our last podcast happened one and a half weeks ago. So it might be. Ancient history to some of you guys, but uh, we still haven't broached it. Have some topics we want to talk about, and the first fight I want to talk about was our fucking boy. He was on our first episode before we had any wheels under us. Um, Darren Crookshank going out there and smashing Henry Mart Mart uh, Martinez. Who, if anything, in the entire fight, the thing he did the best was withstand Crookshank's attacks. I mean, Crookshank came after him in the first round, and you really could could see how much of a pit bull that Henry Martinez is, just going through everything. But uh, eventually, round two, about three minutes in, Darren Crookshank, beautiful head head kick, knocks him cold. Um, yeah, you uh, think think this was the knockout of the night, an award that was uh, eventually given to Eve Edwards. Uh, it, it's hard to say, man. I I felt that they were both slick in their own ways. I mean, uh, Eve even said, "Damn, look at me go!" in the uh, post fight, you know, interview That's with Joe racist. Rogan. I mean, that was yeah, damn. <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> absolutely fantastic knockout for Eve's. But I, I think this right here is a candidate for performance of the year. I mean, you have a guy in Darren Crookshank who I think is probably as dynamic as Pettis and Cerrone as far as striking goes in the lightweight division. He looked amazing. I mean, well, wheel kicks, uh, spinning back fists, uh, body kicks, leg kicks, head kicks, you know, punches. I mean, he just put it to Henry Martinez, man. So I, I'd say if they had a performance of the year for one fight for the uh, fighters only, you know, uh, MMA award show, I'd say he's right up there, man. That was absolutely fantastic. 
For sure, yeah, he looked really, really incredible, and and it was such an a uh, great performance. Honestly, you know, both of us love Crookshank, obviously, for his appearance on the show on our first episode, and for just being a real, real fun guy to to interact with on our Twitter. You know, always talking about funny stuff. He he has one of the funniest Twitters in mixed martial arts. Uh, very, very entertaining. Um, and you know, honestly, I knew he was pretty good. But I never thought of him as a, you know, legitimate lightweight contender in the UFC. I mean, this is one of the most stacked divisions in the promotion. After that that fight, I I I really see him as as one of you know not not one of the top guys, but one of the up and coming guys for sure in the lightweight division. I don't know whether he ever cracks the top ten. You know, if he works on his wrestling, because it seems like wrestling is the foundation of almost every elite fighter right now in the UFC. Um, and obviously, Crookshank has has been relying more on a stand up. Um, how uh, far do you see Darren getting in the lightweight division? Man, I see him going real far. Uh, Joe Rogan co- commented that that really put him on the map, and I agree because Martinez is nowhere near elite level. But the one thing that you have to take away from this fight is that Martinez is a terminator. I mean, that guy took two flush head kicks. And some super punishment in that fight. Kept on trucking forward. He has finishing ability. He's dynamic. He's explosive and powerful. I see him going all the way to the top 10. And I'd like to see him get a top 15 guy in his next fight. For sure, yeah. Um, I don't know if if, if they're uh, going to give him that. But, uh, man, if if they uh, did, it, w- it would be really, really interesting. Um, you know, <clears throat> I don't know if I've ever seen, seen Crookshank utilize his wrestling granted i haven't seen him fight much you know i uh, think was uh this this is his first fight since the tough finale i know he it fought is. chris it tickle is. yeah yeah and and that performance too if you remember back wasn't that impressive against tickle it was a lot of wrestling so um i i actually gave him um you know some props on twitter like man you look much improved dude and that that was excellent and you know he thanked me for it so you know, it's it's it was really noticeable how he changed up his game plan. It might have been opponent based, but uh, that's what I took away from it. Definitely, and and I'm uh, you know I uh, know Darren's got some decent wrestling. He was in Division Three. I don't know what school he uh, went to. Do uh, you you know which um which school in in D three Crookshank wrestled at? I certainly don't. I know he's from Detroit. So that's as far as you know. All I right, go probably with knowledge probably somewhere up up there, but you know, a uh, known D D three wrestler um, has has a black belt in Taekwondo, which he really showed off uh, showed off there. I'm just not uh, not really sure how 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 hard he's uh, going to get, but that would be uh, really great if 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 we saw him rise to the top. Okay, he went to Olivet College. Never heard of it. Um, <clears throat> he went to I, community college. He went to junior college. I uh, know in the Ariel Helwani interview, he was talking about paying off student loans, uh, which I definitely know that game. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll be 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 really great. I know he had hinted about starting to train with um, Team Alpha Male, which I'm sure after this performance they'd accept him with open that. arms. Yeah, when uh, he 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 was on our podcast, he uh, didn't talk about moving there full time, but just talked about going over there briefly to train with Faber and the guys. I forgot. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that would be be really cool if we saw him join Dwayne Ludwig in the gang, who I guess Ludwig uh, took over for Master Tong after Master Tong for some reason disappeared at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, the uh, future is super bright for Darren Crookshank, and um, we'll move on to to a bantamweight fight: Rafael Asuncion defeating Mike Easton via unanimous decision. You know, I, a lot of people had had stock real high in Mike Easton. He trains with the champion Dominic Cruz. Um, you know, dude is a monster at bantamweight. Has has real knockout power. Probably one of the most physically. You know, just just you look at him, and he's a really intimidating dude. And I'm not just saying that because he's black, even though that helps <laughs> somewhat. <laughs> um, I, yeah, you know that little uh, warning, and not because he's black. <laughs> Well, yes, because he's black. Um, do uh, you you think after losing this fight, which I had at thirty twenty seven, two of the judges agreed with me, the other one having at twenty nine twenty eight? I don't really think he had an opening in this fight where he really had a chance to win. 
Um, just didn't look that impressive. Do do you think Mike Easton's a legit bantamweight contender at this point? I think he's well established in the UFC as being legit. Here's my problem with the guy: he is fucking boring. Yeah, he's got legit skills. But he is so goddamn boring. I, I remember just tuning out during that fight, looking back. Oh, yep, same thing. All right, there we go. Every single time that Easton moved in, a Sun Tso had an answer for him, and it was just one twos, one twos all night long. You know, a sparing leg kick, a little clinch work. That was a dog shit fight. Do I think he's a legit contender? Yes. Do I want to watch him fight? Hell no. Really well, well put. Um, he 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 sort of was on a tear. He'd beaten Ivan Menjavar, who recently had a real slick first round submission when he's fighting Uri Faber next. Uh, but yeah, you know, and and uh, Easton also actually beat John Dodson back in two two thousand eight. Um, at a uh, UWC four, I think that's Ultimate Warrior Challenge. Um, but yeah, way back in the day, beat John Dodson was was on this you know eight eight fight tear. Uh, since he made it to the big show, he hadn't lost. Didn't really look that impressive against Rafael Sunciao, and Rafael Sunciao now uh, sort of on a tear of his own. You know, he's 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 one of these guys. I almost feel like you have a lot of guys in the bantamweight and featherweight divisions that have losses on the records, but only losses to top, top guys. I mean, you know, you uh, look at since joining the uh, WEC, uh, Sun Xiao is, you know, something like 8-3, and 7-3. and, three. Um, and Those three losses are to Eric Koch, Diego Nunez, and Uri Faber, um, all of which sit toward the top of that bantamweight division now. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, whether a Sun Xiao will uh, ever get to to that status a number one contender whether he'll he'll just be one of these elite gatekeeper type guys uh you know it'll be another one of those things that'll be interesting to keep an eye on very interesting i agree a sun sal has some excellent skills he trains in uh i believe georgia with uh the lima's brothers i know that strangely brian stan actually trains out of that camp sometimes as well so he has legit training partners um, I, I just think that, I don't know, there's something that he's never ascended to the next level. Kind of kind of like a couple guys out there who always do real well. You know, like Melvin Gillard does real well against B competition, lower A competition, and then just kind of stumbles against legit A competition. So this was kind of a Sun Tso's coming up party. Uh, sorry, coming out party. But um, doesn't mean that he'll do so well in his next fight. Who knows, man? I mean, he could stumble again. I think it'll take two wins in a row to really put him on that level. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree. Uh, yeah, and you know, sort of avoid beating a dead horse. We'll move on to um, Ramsey's boy, Eves, the Thug Jitsu Master, Edwards, defeating Jeremy Steven, getting KO of the night, uh, knocking out Stevens just two minutes in, which. You know, they both were devastating knockouts. I actually thought Crookshank was more warranted the knockout of the night because it was the most exciting knockout. I think that's all it should be, just the most visceral knockout, period. And I don't think you really can beat a head kick knockout that puts a dude cold. <clears throat> but I do see Edwards getting a little bit of favor just because it took Darren Crookshank eight minutes uh, and it took Eve Edwards just a minute 55 to put Jeremy Stevens down with punches and elbows, which also going toward Crookshank, you got to respect just the one punch, one kick knockouts. And Eve's was, was ruled a KO, but it was almost more of a TKO the way he swarmed him. Um, yeah, you know, it it uh, really makes makes me, me think this uh, was a fight with... Two two guys who had 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 losses in their previous fights. Um, Edwards had had lost to uh, Tony Ferguson at the Ultimate F- Fighter 14 finale. Jeremy Stevens now on a three fight losing streak, um, losing to Pettis, Cerrone, and Edwards. And it's interesting to note that Pettis and Cerrone couldn't stop him. Both of those fights went to decisions. The Pettis fight went to a split decision. Eve Edwards stopped him in two minutes. So, you know, the thug thug jitsu master definitely has has his skills obviously. Uh he's he's a top guy on the ground and he really showed off that that striking at the UFC on Fox Henderson Diaz card. I don't know where the ceiling is it is for for this uh dude. I you know, I if if you had had to have me guess what happened in a fight with him and all the top 5 guys in the lightweight 
I I don't think Eves wins any of those fights against guys like Cerrone, Diaz, Henderson. Um, but I still think he's real good, and I think you know if he knocks off a couple more wins, I don't know where where really the the ceiling for him lies. That's a, a great point, man. And I just kind of wanted to make a quick note on the fight. Um, I really underestimated Eves in this fight, man. I mean. He's had such an up and down career. He's had fantastic moments like uh, that flying head kick on uh, Josh Thompson at UFC 47 or 49. Can't remember exactly which one. Uh, but, you know, and then he's had some real stinkers too, where, you know, he just kind of grinded stuff out, you know, got dominated. So it's up and down, man. It's hard to gauge on someone when there's so many levels of their career. And you're like, well, is he going to fall into this level or ascend? What I can take away from this fight, and as far as the ceiling goes, is that even at his age and at the amount of mileages that he's taken in the fight game, he still has the athletic ability and real just um, experienced talent to knock out a younger, stronger guy in Jeremy Stevens. I mean, uh, Jeremy Stevens was a beast at one point. I think he's fallen on hard times, but that guy has, I think, uh, the hardest punches at lightweight, at least in the UFC. And uh, Eves made it look easy. He was very slick, and uh, you know his movement's awesome. So as far as ceiling goes, good fucking question, man. I think he should get a real stiff test in his next fight to keep this train going while he has some confidence. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely has a little bit of mileage on the tank. Sixty-one professional fights now. That's uh, mental. Yeah, that's MMA mental. Uh, he's forty-two, eighteen, and one. Uh, only thirty-six years old though, uh, so he probably has at least two or three more years in the tank. Uh, one of the few guys who who can say he was fighting in the UFC as far back as 2001. Uh, his UFC debut was against, can you guess? Who was it? Uh, just, okay, hold just, on, ask that just, question again. Just uh, because you're the UFC encyclopedia, who, did, who was Eve Edwards' UFC debut against? Debut? Fuck, debut, man. first fight I don't, in the UFC. I don't, I don't know much about Eve Edwards, so I'm just going to say that it was not Josh Thompson. Is that correct? Nope. wasn't That's Josh correct. Thompson. Josh okay. Thompson was his sixth fight. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to oh, say... Oh, wait, no, seventh, was, seventh. I'm, I'm going to say something weird. Robbie Lawler, Josh Near, something like that. Robbie Lawler. I don't know if he ever fought Lawler or Near, but uh, his, his no. first fight in the UFC, UFC 33... And he, he lost a majority decision to Matt Serra. Matt Serra! Yeah, there he is. Fought at welterweight. Uh, it was a welterweight bout, and I think uh, most, if not all, of his other fights have been a lightweight. Uh, he had a 160-pound catchweight against Dwayne Ludwig back at Strike Force Destruction. But uh, yeah, the thug, thug jitsu master, um, I, was, I was just happy for Ramsey's because... Uh, Ramsey's is a big fan. I need to stop playing with these keys because I'm sure they're making yeah. loud bangs yeah. in the I, background. I have a, a Ramsey's impression, by the way, I've been working on. <laughs> Bust it out. Right now? Right fucking now. All right. Eve Edwards from Austin, Texas. Going to put the stamp down on him. Thank you. <laughs> Blunt and to, to the point. Almost sort of like a Jim Rome type. You know, he kind of... He talks... Like this, kind of. very In a way, kind it's of very yeah. hard to get his it's, mannerisms. It, it is very hard. Um, I'm trying. Uh, um, yeah, we'll move on to the main card, I guess. Before I make any more fake orgasms, uh, Matt Brown defeating Mike Swick. You know, m- m- most of the people who were uh, who have been following this sport for a little while, you know, think fondly of Swick. Think back to those days where he was wrecking everybody. Um, just not the same Mike Swick. You know, he took took that really long extended break uh, in Thailand. Um, I don't know if we'll ever see that old Mike Swick again. But Matt Matt Brown did look impressive. Uh, do you think he's a legit contender at welterweight? Of course I do, man. I've been saying it for a long time. When we come up with potential next matchups for you know top fifteen guys at welterweight, I always bring up Matt Brown, man. I mean, he's got. Four wins in 2012 alone. He had a real bad slump, and I was like, okay, maybe he's done. But he has completely turned himself around. Four wins in 2012, three by destructions, and one, you know, kind of 
decision against Wonder Boy Thompson, who is like a young kid, you know, and put the beat down on him. I think that he is well rounded. He has submissions, TKOs, and uh, I think he's just got this fire in him, man. I want to see him get a legit top 10 guy in his next fight. For sure, for sure, yeah, you know, he's uh, one of these guys training with, uh, he, he uh, trains with Matt Hume in Seattle and at Throwdown in Las Vegas, uh, brown belt in judo, purple belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, great wrestling, you know, guys with all three of those tools and who who can regularly finish dudes in the first round, uh, you know, it, He's not one of these guys who who you hear a lot about because he doesn't talk a lot, but he has a his 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 toolbox sort of like the way I like to say with Cerrone, he has a full toolbox. He he can bust out any weapon he wants so against full. you. Such a full toolbox. Um, and uh, Swick, even though I love him, you know, just just kind of I don't want to say sits back on his kickboxing, but uh, just I. I haven't necessarily seen, you know, the the wrestling grit out of him, the jujitsu grit. He's he's like one of these guys of of the old era of UFC who who that, you know, two or three years ago you had guys who were just one one trick ponies, a la your Chuck Liddell's, who who just had that one skill they always went back to and relied on. And I think in this era of UFC, you're going to see that less and less, start seeing guys like Ben Henderson who have tons of tools in their toolbox. Tons of tools, man. Tons of tools. And as far toolbox. as Mike Swick goes... Toolbox, our little toolbox. MMA um, mental. Yeah, as far as Swick goes, he has had some health issues it's obviously taken its toll and he looks so unhealthy at welterweight i thought ever since he made his debut i'm like that does not look healthy i mean i understand he's quick and everything but i, I mean at what price i think he should actually go back up to middleweight man that, i think he was a uh, much more dominating and seemed to be healthier force at that weight class he he left after one loss to yushin okami so it was kind of a pride thing in my opinion back up to 185 for sure, um, he, yeah, he, he he just just looks gaunt at 170, and and the dudes fought at 205 before, so you know just get get back to 185 and uh, make your mark again. Um, I guess we got to move on to Roy McDonald versus BJ Penn, my boy, my my favorite fighter of all time. Uh, <clears throat> got his ass whooped, plain and simple. Roy McDonald looked absolutely amazing. BJ Penn, you know, for all the people saying that nobody can beat a motivated BJ Penn, Roy went in there and he kicked a motivated BJ Penn's ass. And, you know, I this is just a, at least the the way I look at it. BJ loves trying to prove people wrong and he 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 was a lightweight masquerading as a welterweight, fighting a middleweight masquerading as a welterweight. Rory could fight at 185, BJ could fight at 155, and he was just overpowered. A lot of people are calling for him, him to retire, but there are a lot of really, really intriguing matches that could be made back at 155 with BJ Penn, whether it's Gilbert Melendez, BJ Penn, um, Nate Diaz versus BJ Penn. There are a ton of guys I'd like to see BJ Penn fight at 155 pounds. Um, even Benson Henderson versus BJ Penn. You know, if Penn gets a couple wins a lightweight, um, <clears throat> that would that would be an interesting fight as well. Uh, just there's not many matches at 170 that I see ideal for BJ. It was kind of bizarre that he called out Rory McDonald, one of the biggest people in the division. Um, but uh, yeah, just didn't didn't really shape out. Do uh, you think BJ Penn should retire at this point? You know what? I really don't. <clears throat> Judging by his work ethic for this fight and how he held up even under that just intense pressure of Roy McDonald, the much bigger man, I, I think that he still has a lot left. I, he's not that old. He's what? He's 34 at this point, something like that, 33. You know, he's not that old. And um, 155 is his natural weight class. He's a monster there. He lost two decisions to Frankie Edgar and decided to move up. He's never looked spectacular at 170. I think he should go back down to 155. He knows it. We all know it. He just doesn't like to cut weight. That's the only issue. That's really the only thing. You know, BJ is notorious for being kind of lazy when it comes to, you know, c cutting that weight down. So um, as far as 
fights at 155, the one that I love that you brought up, <clears throat> Nate Diaz, man, it's redemption. You know, that's a big selling fight because you got a, a, an already built storyline of, you know, BJ retiring after the beating he took from Nick. And then to come back, you know, at 155 and fight Nick's brother, I think that is a big time seller. And imagine that stare down too, right? A couple of crazy eyed motherfuckers going up and, you know, obviously, if I had to uh, script it up now, I would say, uh, I would say that Diaz puts his fists in uh, BJ's face as he always do and BJ will try and like, Walk at him and chest bump him, and uh, DJ well, just eats his fists. Just he just he just <laughs> bites off his index finger, Un- unhinges his jaw, and swallows his pistol. Ow! He eats both of his arms. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it was it was a sad fight for me as I'm a huge BJ Penn fan. But uh, you know what? I if anything, I I hope that just this just makes him realize, hey, you know, it, it's a different game back. Back when I won the uh, welterweight title in 06, there weren't as many monsters at welterweight as there are now. During during 06, the only monsters in the welterweight division were GSP and Matt Hughes. Well, and you got to remember, Frank Trigg was a number one contender that year. Frank yeah. fucking Trigg. <laughs> yeah, and Frank Trigg got embarrassed twice by Hughes. Once, him literally being picked up ran across the cage, slammed down, which Trigg is one of these people who I think about historically, and I think, man, what a bum. I'm like, hey, you know, he did almost stop Hughes, but just never could could win those fights that he really needed to to uh, secure his legacy. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, tons of an- animals at welterweight, Rory being one of them. How uh, far do you think Rory is from a title shot? I think he's two wins away from a title shot. If he wins again, I think you're 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 gonna hear his his name mentioned first for welterweight contendership. Um, obviously, Hendricks is gonna get the next shot as as long as he gets through Jake Ellenberger. <clears throat> but if Rory beats uh, who's he match up against Condit? Rory called out that that rematch for Condit. He's gonna face Condit at UFC 158 in Montreal, which is gonna be big too. You gotta feel bad for Condit having to fight two of Canada's probably literally the two most popular fighters in Canada back to back. Um, <clears throat> both of those fights in Montreal. Uh, you know, if Rory beats Condit gets a number number one contendership fight and wins that, do you think he's he's due a title shot? Well, first off, you said back-to-back back wrong. I would have said back-to-back. At-to-at. Back-to-ace. Ace-to-mouth. He definitely, if he can get past Condit, who we all know is a killer, then I think you're absolutely correct with one more fight after that for number one contendership. But I wanted to ask you something, man. Uh, how do you feel about him getting a rematch with someone who just destroyed him in that third round? And that guy's coming off a loss, even if it is to the champion. He's coming off of a loss. I, it doesn't make sense to me, man. Put him in there with uh, you know, Eric Silva if he gets past his next opponent. Put him against the winner of Damian Maya versus John Fitch. I, I don't like to see all these rehashed fights. And even though there's a storyline of redemption, I don't really want to see it. Um, I don't really care how much Rory's evolved. Condit's gotten better as well, man. I mean, his finishing rate is fantastic. So uh, how, how do you feel about that? Personally, if I was Silva, I uh, would have made Rory McDonald versus Nate Marquardt after he uh, chews up Tarek Safadine in that Strike Force finale. But um, <clears throat> you know what? I... I see why it was made. Rory seems, Rory almost a lot of times seems like he's too serious for his own own good. I mean, you know, t- every fighter under the face of the earth has lost. I literally cannot think of a great fighter who hasn't lost a fight, and this is Anderson included. GSP, Fedor, John Jones, technically, <laughs> um, every great <laughs> fighter has lost a match. And, you know, you just got to deal with it. I mean, literally, Jose Aldo, his, the first fight of his career, he lost. He started his, his career 0-1, and, and now he's 29-1. and um, You know, I I get Rory's 14-1. and That's the one smudge on his record. 
but I think he's too serious for his own own good, you know. Uh, Rogan was talking to him after the uh, fight, and he was like, it's a fight that still haunts me. I just want redemption. I'm like, chill the fuck out, Rory. Yeah, You just yeah. fucking won! <laughs> you just won, and, and, you know, he's talking about ghosts and shit. Like, this, this fight haunts me to this day, and, dude, get over it. I, you know, I understand why you would want to fight Condit, but just there are much bigger fish to uh, fry and there's a reason the UFC doesn't put losers and winners up against each other it's because you know you have a guy whose stock is rising in Condit or a, a guy whose stock's rising in McDonald Condit yeah even though it, it was t- to the champion a loss is a loss um I don't know if I was in M- McDonald's place I would have called out Jay, or um, I would have called out Johnny Hendricks, just because that that's the you know that was before Ellen Berger um, Ellen Berger had which I don't know it's it it's actually hard to uh, say uh, say that because everyone thought Hendricks was going to be fighting GSP next I don't know it all just really uh, really con- confuses me maybe our friend uh, Dancing Doll on the MMA playground can call in a few favors and we can see if we can get Rory on the show. Um, <clears throat> that would be uh, pretty fun. Are we breaking down Hendrix Ellenberger? Yes. Positive energy. Good. Yes. And one thing I wanted to bring up real quick is the perfect uh, adjective for Rory McDonald is grumpy-ass hipster. Yeah, he's a grumpy he's, fucking hipster, dude. That's, he's that's a like grumpy the worst hipster. kind of hipster. At least if you were a happy hipster, you'd be manageable and likable. But he's fucking grumpy. <laughs> no, I'm not going out tonight. I already have a six-pack of PBR here. Leave me alone. Yeah, Leave me and, alone. I'm going to cry and listen to Morrissey. I don't know if you you heard the Mike Ricci interview on uh, on on the MA Hour with Ariel Help. Hell, Hawani, but it seems like, you know, Richie and Rory are apparently really good friends. I feel like they almost feed off their own weird grumpiness, because Richie is 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 uh, going on the uh, MMA hour. Every tough interview I've heard has been the, the same sort of thing. Yeah, it sucks living in in the house, but it's it's whatever. I got an awesome shot at it. Ricci was talking about, like, I'm emotionally disturbed from it, and I was institutionalized, and the producers told me that that I've been affected n- more negatively by this show than anybody in the 12 years, and poor me, and uh, it's so horrible, and I would just, I would, I was a robot, and it. I would just sleep for two hours, and I would go try, it was literally like, it was just like, alright, uh, it sucks, that's, that, that, that's bad, but when it comes down to it, you could have left at any moment, you're the one who signed up for it, it isn't like you weren't aware that you were going to be isolated in a house for X amount of weeks, um... It was it was just just a very very strange interview. I must feel like Roy McDonald and Mike Ricci just don't have souls. They don't um, have souls, and their relationship is well, very sexual. They're they fighting. Are... They're fighting over hipster sweatshirts in some swanky shop in like Montreal. So, yeah, and end up dialing a couple digits up each other's hind hind ends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sure if we ever have, have Roy on uh, that. We hope he doesn't hear this. Just he like doesn't warm- because he spends most of his time crying in the shower. Just like we hope, if we ever have War Machine on, he no- doesn't listen to the roundtable. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you know, both of these these guys, you know, perfect. Ex- you know, I'll we'll uh, get get to who Augustuson in one moment. But um, you know, Ricci, the the first thing Ariel does is. Um, is kind of jokingly says, "Oh yeah, I was I was I was chatting with with your uh, manager, and he he said you um, he he said that you weren't sure that that I'm from Montreal. This is Ariel talking, and Mike's just like, huh? It's like you know, he was saying that you were doubting my uh, true Montreal roots. It's like, yeah, where are you from? Oh, I was from this part of Montreal. What about you?" I was from here. Oh, the NSW. Awesome, awesome. See, yeah, we're both both from Montreal. Oh, oh. 
<laughs> it was the. Dude, I'm, I'm going to go back and watch this right when this podcast is it done, was, just so I can flip him off. And just, <laughs> it was weirder than when MMA Mental had Steven Quadros on. <laughs> but, um, no, it was, you know, Richie and Rory are two of these guys who, maybe that's that's the persona they are trying to play. They're, you know, trying to be the cold, calculating sort of person. But, uh, you know what, just get over yourselves. Um, ah, that was a lot about hipsters yeah, and poop. emotions. Um, let's move on. Poop. I'm feeling hipster myself. Eat round like, what we poop. just did was a hipster thing. <laughs> it was pretty hipster, actually. we we got to break out the PBRs after this. Um, thank God I'm not Moving in on. So many hipsters in games. Oh, fuck. Um, Alexander Gustafson defeating Shogun Hua via unanimous decision. Also sort of a one-sided beatdown. Um, I was incredulously hammered after BJ Penn lost. I th- I think I uh, I think I drank an entire handle of Jack Daniels just in one gulp, and um, yeah. I think I watched the end of this in the hospital room. But uh, <laughs> you're just you're just telling the orderlies put it on, put it on, it's it's 50 bucks. put it on. <laughs> <laughs> no, this 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 was the uh, Fox card. They didn't have to pay anything, son. But, um, yeah, Gustafson, who, uh, man, I, I was not expecting the, the the result that went down. Every one of Hua's fights is a war, and I was expecting, whether Gustafson won or lost, that he was going to be fucked up afterwards. Gustafson wasn't really that, that fucked up. He used that Dominic Cruz style of hopping around, using su- superior footwork, uh, Gustafson... Obviously, and it's so funny too because he looks like Cruz too. He looks like a six-five blonde Swedish version of Dominic Cruz, and he fights the same way. Just dances around. Um, looks like an oversized Nordic baby, as you you like to uh, say. Just looked amazing. Um, and I don't know really whether to put stock in Gustafsson or take stock out of Hua. Um, do you think this is Shogun's career starting to see the beginning of the end? I certainly don't, and here's why. Shogun Hua looked fan-fucking-tastic in this fight, and here's why. He's shown up fat for his last two fights. He showed up to this fight in incredible shape. His normal love handles and thickness were gone, and uh, for the first time since he fought Machida the first time, he was actually using kicks, man, leg kicks, body kicks. He was throwing those kicks again, so... I certainly do not see this being the end um, of his career at all. In fact, I would have to say like a phoenix, a beautiful Brazilian phoenix rising from the ashes as Corey Sandoval, (laughs) good buddy of mine once said, he is not done. Yeah, and he's uh, your your boy's favorite fighter, and I don't think he got torn up as bad as my favorite fighter, so, you know, obviously... A future for him at light heav- heavyweight, um, but I think this is the the end of him legitimately being a title contender. I don't think he'll he'll get his rematch against Jones um, because you know you're you're seeing these young guys. Gustafson went out there and uh, put it to Shogun. I actually had Shogun winning this fight. I hadn't seen Gustafson with a win this quality in his whole career. Burp, and he uh, really impressed me. Um, I'm kind of going into Gustafson, how how far do you think he is from a title shot? Um, you know, Dana White said before Gustafson Hua that the winner would get a title shot, which absolutely enrages me because uh, I want to see Dan Henderson get that shot, and he's just getting fucked at every corner. But um, do you think Gustafson should get a title shot now? One fight away, two fights away. I say. Let Jones fight Sonnen. Let Jones fight the winner of Henderson versus Machida. Then uh, have Gustafson f- fight a top guy. Fight a Phil Davis, maybe. You know, Davis was supposed to fight at UFC 1- 155. Let's uh, see a rematch of Gustafson versus Davis. And after uh, Jones gets through Chael and the winner of Henderson versus Machida, uh, we see him fight whoever wins that rematch of Phil Davis and Gustafson. I'm going to be honest with you. That breakdown that you just did was like fucking Inception. It was like, and then this guy, and then this other guy, and then you cross him over, and these two guys fight each other maybe at the end of the <laughs> But I, I got the gist of it. I think it's potatoes and tomatoes. I mean, you know, who deserves it more? Henderson's been out for a long time. Machida came off of a great win and a uh, spectacular loss as well. So, I mean... 
do they deserve it? Yeah, they're they've put in their time, they put in their dues. Chael Sonnen doesn't deserve it, that's for sure. Uh, so Gustafson, a rematch with Davis, I don't think it's going to happen. They're training partners now, and I, I couldn't see that actually happening. Um, so I would actually like to see Gustafson face the winner of Sonnen Jones just for the fact that he has put in a uh, pretty decent goddamn streak, put his name on the map with a win over Shogun. He deserves it more. Uh, Henderson just bitches and moans all the time. As much as I like the guy, he's always just bitching about shit. Uh, so I don't really want to see that. And Machida is nowhere near, you know, a title shot right now after the embarrassment and then knocking out Bader. I mean, I, I just don't see it. So I say put Gustafson in there. He's taller than Jones. He's athletic and fast. That's more compelling than seeing two, uh, you know, kind of older gentlemen fight John Jones. Yeah. Um, and Machida definitely got his chance against Jones. I don't know. If if Machida could do anything differently, though, I almost feel like Jones almost pulled an Anderson Silva in, in, in that fight, sort of broke him down in the first round. And, uh, yeah, seeing guys like, like Jones and Silva is scary. <laughs> Machida legitimately threatened Jones in that first round, and then Jones came out in the second round and uh, literally choked him to sleep. Um, yeah, so, uh, Gustafson, stock rising, who, uh, will, uh, see what goes down with his career. And before we get to, um, to the main event of Henderson versus Nate Diaz, just wanted to throw this out there. I was checking the, the, uh, Twitter machine and, um, actually the, the manager of, um, 2012 BJJ No Gi World Champ, Chad Savage George, uh, three, he, uh, was back in the WEC as well. Uh, Chad George, um, his manager just sent me a DM saying he'd love to get on the podcast sometime. I uh, just did tap out radio with Straka. Um, yeah, that would, that would be really cool. So definitely in the coming episodes, look out for that. Um, <clears throat> love having to kind of tap into, to the minds of Fantastic, fighters and grapplers man. alike. Yeah. These, uh, grapplers are all very, very, um, I don't know what the, um, word is, so I probably shouldn't have started running my fucking yap, but, uh, very, <clears throat> very cerebral, there it is, uh, just, you know, the, uh, way the paths work out, and you really gotta be, uh, be super, super cerebral to, to excel in the game of grappling, so, uh, powerful Chad George, looking forward to having him on. Powerful. Powerful Jake Walters, powerful MMA podcast, powerful MMA metal powerful Chris Lowe. Um, let us get to that championship match. Powerful Benson Henderson. Jesus Christ. Nate Diaz was fucking people up. He he was not just defeating these elite lightweights by, you know, split decisions and whatnot. He armbarred Takanori Gomi in the first round and has returned to lightweight after losing to Rory and Dong Young Kim. I hate this next part. Uh, close... Earmuffs, he beat the living fuck out of Donald Cerrone. One of the most one-sided decision victories I've ever seen. I think he broke, broke a compu strike record for just the volume of punches that he landed. <laughs> he landed, I think, close to 400 punches during that fight. It was 300-something. Um, and then the fight with Jim Miller, uh, who, who uh, kind of funny, it's, he, he looks just like my uh, buddy Murphy. And um, it was almost disturbing because I felt like he was choking my my uh, buddy out. But hey, he uh, turned yeah. him into a hedgehog the way he was grimacing. He looked exactly oh, he, like he, a he baby guillotine. Ch- he guillotine <laughs> choked him and made him bite his own tongue so hard that it started bleeding. Gross. Um, so yeah, put put together those three impressive, impressive wins. Benson Henderson goes out there and makes him look like a chump. Fifty to forty three. On one of the judges' cards, the other two had it 50-45. None of them gave Nate Diaz a tie or a win in any of the five rounds. And uh, before we talk about you know the future of Nate Diaz, uh, who who gets the title shot next for Ben Henderson? The one thing that people were talking about most during the fight, or you know, let's uh, talk talk about the fight itself first before we get into toothpick game. Thank you. Um, yeah. What do you think about about the fight? Do you do you think it was it was just Nate not not showing up? Do you think Ben Ben is this dominant? You know, we haven't seen him fight anybody not named Frankie Edgar for the straps, so we didn't really know where he necessarily was at. Um, I think it is a huge testament to to Ben 
Ben Henderson, he he is now in my top five pound for pound with Aldo, GSP, Anderson Silva, and John Jones. Uh, top top four pound for pound. But I think this fight would have been a lot closer if it wasn't for that first round punch to Nate Diaz's right eye. His eye was all sorts of fucked up. I think he broke his or- orbital bone. Probably needed surgery. You know, uh, Diaz was. Diaz was wearing his hat real low during the press conference, and every time he looked up, you could just see his eye was fucked. And coming from from someone who's broken his orbital bone twice, I uh, know it, I haven't ever needed surgery on it, but a doctor told me if I break it again, I might, just because orbital bones are not a bone that will, you know, break, heal, break, heal, break, heal. It's more susceptible to permanent damage, so... Hopefully he didn't need surgery, but uh, yeah, I think, I think that left from Ben Henderson really fucked up Diaz's eye. Diaz actually said in the post-fight presser that he was waiting for the vision to come back, and it just never did. Um, what are your thoughts on that fight? Well, I'll tell you what. You brought up a, a great point that I didn't really think into. I saw a swollen eye, which to me can be two things. An orbital break, like you said. Or just repeated punching the same eye very hard. I mean, with the ground and pound he was unleashing, the punches he was unleashing, it was just one of those things where you were, you asked me if do you think Nate just didn't show up? I don't think so at all. I think that that eye punch had a definite impact on the fight. But Nate Diaz is a true warrior, and to undersell him saying that, oh, he just was impaired, hell no, that guy's going to keep on trucking, and he did. That fight was fantastic, man. Top three favorite for me for Ben Henderson fights. You got number one, his first fight with Cerrone. Number two, his fight with Pettis. And then this one. In the UFC, he's had ups and downs against opponents. His second Frank Yeager fight was horrible. His fight with Mark Bocek was pretty plotting. But he savaged Jim Miller, and he beat the fuck out of Clay Guida. You know, those are up there as well. So... You know, I was kind of on the fence when this fight came up. I'm like, well, his last fight with Frankie just leg kicked his way to a decision. He delivered in spades in this fight, man. You had power takedowns. You had trips. You had clinch work. You had submission escapes. You had vicious ground and pound. You had taunting and just tons of strikes being thrown. That was an amazing fight. And like I said, uh, when we watched it, he absolutely savaged Nate Diaz. Oh, yeah, just um, <clears throat> one of these guys, like I mentioned a little before, so many tools in the toolbox. He's so athletic, has great striking, great wrestling. He is unsubmittable, literally has the best submission defense. In my opinion, not just the UFC now, probably has the best submission defense in MMA. UFC. In MMA history, I mean, I, w- I would say in the history of MMA, he is up there with the Gracies as far as how unsubmittable he is. Just, you know, almost at times look- looks like his joints are made out of rubber. Um, guy guy can't be submitted. He has world cra- world class wrestling and can strike with the best of them. Has an amazing frame for for you know fighting. That was very homoerotic as well. But, um, yeah, just <clears throat> really, really wonderful fighter. Yeah, definitely. And one last point I wanted to bring up is, uh, is, the, fact, uh, is the fact that uh, you asked me, you know, did Nate not show up? Uh, one other aspect that we had to think about was the fact of his game plan, which was leg kicking at distance, uh, using scrambles and using clinch work to shut off the game of Nick Diaz. And George St. Pierre even thanked Benson Henderson on UFC Tonight uh, for that exact game plan. So Ben Henderson has uh, obviously great coaches at the MMA lab. Could I hear George St. Pierre personally thanking Benson for uh, giving him that, that technique for his upcoming Nick Diaz fight? Benson, uh, uh... I thank you for giving me the blueprint to beating a Diaz. Uh, and now to thank you wholeheartedly, uh, please remove your pants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. George George wants, wants to uh, get a fistful of those big old quads. And I won't go any further with that. Um, and the thing I was going to talk about before we talked about the fight was Toothpick Gate. This was the craziest thing. I'm 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 sure we're still going to bring it up years from now. It was absolutely insane. Benson Henderson, this lightweight championship against one of the top guys in the sport, 25-minute fight, 
and he fought the entire time with a fucking toothpick in his mouth. What do you think? You know, I I saw a, a bunch of Diaz apologists saying that Benson Henderson should have gotten disqualified, and I think that's that's a little overboard because um, <clears throat> obviously it didn't affect the fight in any way, but I still do think it poses danger. Yeah, yeah, it does pose a little bit of danger to his his, his opponent or the referee if something freakish happens, but the obvious danger is to himself. I'm like, dude, Jesus Christ, you've got a toothpick in your mouth and you're fighting one of the toughest guys in the world. What what, what the hell do you think about all that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, man. If it makes him comfortable, I'm not going to judge you know, doing what he did can't at judge. the same, can't judge. You cannot sit in judgment of others, even though it's very fun. You can't do it. Um, you cannot judge. <laughs> yeah, I can't, you can, but, uh, <laughs> um, it's really, really irresponsible as a champion, a high level fighter and being on Fox to go out there with a sharp object in your mouth while you're fighting uh, it puts you at risk. It puts the Fox, you know, investors and people who run the show at risk. It puts your opponent at risk, and it puts the UFC at risk. I think they got to put the kibosh on this thing, man, because it's interesting and different and hilarious as it is. It was completely irresponsible. It was totally irresponsible, and I don't. I believe it's because of the lack of a fighters' union that we don't see more fines. If fines were prevalent, we would have seen a fine handed down. And um, I I can almost guarantee you that the only punishment is going to be a stern, stern talking to by the president, Dana White, and we never see it again. Um, and I'm uh, hoping that, you know... You will wonder if Henderson's going to do it, you know, if he's already done this in multiple fights from what I've heard, if a stern talking to will be enough to get him to stop doing it. But, uh, yeah, just crazy, crazy. Uh, you know, you, you were Dana White saying it was the craziest thing he saw in his entire career. So that, that was absolutely insane. Um, and we'll get on to, to the future of the two title contenders, Nate Diaz and Benson Henderson. Uh, yeah, that sounded beautiful. God damn. Ew. Yeah, yeah, don't don't usually burp, but I feel like when I hop on the uh, podcast, just 90% of my burps come out between the hours of 9 and 11 Eastern on Wednesdays and 7 burp. and 9 Thursdays, but when, when I, do, I do, I'm podcasting. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Fucking bullshit. But, um, yeah, talking about uh, the the contender, Nate Diaz, do you think he's he's going to have another title shot in his career? Absolutely. He has the skills to back it up. He's improved immensely, and all of his losses in MMA were due to being undersized or bullshit decisions. So absolutely, man. He went against Ben Henderson with possibly a bum eye and still was in there, still taunting. Of course he's going to get another title shot. I'd like to see the guy drop down to 145. He's a gangly 155. That weight cut, I think, is doable for him, and I think it's pride that's keeping him away from that. But I'd like to see him make a run at that featherweight strap. I don't know, man. Dude would be like a skeleton at a featherweight. You know, yeah, like six- Pablo Garza. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it's very true. Dude, six foot tall, um, has a has a six four reach. Actually, I'm I'm the same. I'm six feet tall. I have a six four reach. So. Um, I'm obviously and we're not, not as trim. Arms. Yeah, <laughs> oh, we're talking about penises. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know if he could make that that cut. But at the same time, I feel like he he doesn't have a size disadvantage to anybody in the lightweight division. So especially the the way he was just handing top lightweights their ass, including Donald Cerrone, who might be fighting for a title shot soon. Um. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I, I say we we're gonna see him fight um, for a title again, just just because out of all the current crop of title contenders, he maybe posed the biggest problem. Um, he was one of the more dominant contenders out there, and uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing Nate Diaz get uh, tossed someone his way who he can uh, tear up. Um, next for Benson Henderson. I think is it official yet that the winner of uh, Cerrone versus Pettis is is going to get that shot? Um, 
that's that's the shot that makes the most sense. Now, on the same token, if you think about it, you know, real logically, it really sucks the fact that we're going to have rematches yet again. I mean, we got a trilogy fight, and, and it is compelling, but we're going to have a trilogy fight with Cerrone. We're going to have a rematch with Pettis, the last man to dismantle Benson Henderson. But it's like it shows you the lack of uh, real – even in a deep division, as far as guys that are really up there in contendership, it, there's a lack right now, man. I mean, Lozon versus Miller, that's compelling. But God damn it, get Gilbert Melendez in here. Get Eddie Alvarez in. We need some fresh talent in this lightweight division. As stacked as it is, there's no guys, I feel, at the top that are really warranting that title shot right now. No, you have lots of guys knocking on on the door. Um, <clears throat> you have your Matt Wyman's, your Rafael Dos Anjos's, but you know those 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 two guys in particular, Alvarez and Melendez. Melendez, I could see getting immediate title shot just because the way he put people away in strike force. Alvarez, I would have said the same thing if not for that loss to Michael Chandler. I think he needs at least a fight. Uh, maybe we'll we'll see a Nate Diaz Eddie Alvarez fight if uh, the UFC can lock it down. We have news on him uh, in our news briefs toward the end of the show, but uh, yeah, just lots of rematches on on the horizon. Which rematches have been kind of the name of the game in the lightweight uh, championship um, picture. You know, you had. Uh, Edgar fight BJ Penn twice, then you had Edgar fight Gray Maynard twice, then you had Edgar fight Benson Henderson twice, which I'm calling a draw for Edgar Aldo just because I'm 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 gonna pick that Edgar rematches every single person he faces from here on out. Dude, I think <laughs> he shouldn't fight anyone new from here on out. Just the same fight every rematches. three months, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, yeah, maybe a Henderson Melendez match. Uh, I agree. I I think Pettis Cerrone. You know, even though it is uh, compelling, and that Cerrone Henderson one was one of the greatest fights of all time, and I think Pettis has given Henderson the only loss on his record. Um, but uh, yeah, just just a lot of uh, fuckery going on right now with the lightweight division, and I guess in the next couple months, especially, it kind of hinges on on Melendez, which I think it's pretty sure Melendez is going to be in the UFC. I don't know what the contract status is, but I'm sure we'll see him in the UFC next. And Alvarez, who um, the UFC has made an offer to. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, you have anything on uh, on on that that fight or? Uh, the entire card before we move on. Not really, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, let's let's really quick do a do a unsolved mysteries. Let's do it. Tonight on unsolved mysteries, we broach toothpick gate. How did Benson Henderson? Get a sharp toothpick past the Washington State Commission on December 8th, 2012. Benson Henderson goes into a 25-minute MMA match against Nate Diaz with a toothpick in his mouth. What happened? Scenario number one. He paid off the people that check his mouth and told them that he would have a toothpick in it and that he would indeed use it to cut Nate Diaz's neck during the fight and sacrifice him to Jesus Christ. Theory number two. Benson Henderson coughs up toothpicks similar to the way cats cough up hairballs. Doing this in the second round, he coughed up a toothpick and instead of spitting it out, decided to chew on it. Scenario number three. Benson Henderson has wooden teeth. During the fight, he clenches his teeth so hard that it splinters and toothpicks come out of his teeth, similar to George Washington. Chris Lowe, do you have any theories on Toothpick Gate? I certainly do. I certainly do. All right, and uh, what's that word here? Theory! Theory! (laughs) It's a number five or four. I'm fucking this shit up. Theory number four. Theory number four. Benson Henderson always has a pack of toothpicks in his mouth and dispenses them ad hoc. (laughs) 
That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> That's all he's got. What a great sin. What a great segue to let me know he's done. If you or anybody you know has any information on Toothpick Gate, we stress you to call local law enforcement or nine one one. I'm Jake Walters, and this has been Unsolved Mysteries. All right, yay! Yay us! Yay us! We're so clever. <laughs> Um, uh, let's, uh, breeze through some of these fights so we can get on to, um, to, to some news. Only two fights I really want to talk about on the Tough Smashes card on FX. Um, Chad Mendez breezing through, what a joke fight, Yautzen Meza. I'm a huge MMA fan, and I've never heard of Yautzen Meza. For a guy like Chad Mendez to be fighting him, um, obviously just, they just want to boost Chad Mendez back up the division. Um, he's, you know, pretty marketable being, you know, kind of your eye favors understudy over at Alpha Male. So whatever. Yay. You beat a nobody. Um, we'll see if he, uh, gets through some elite guys. I, I bet we see him fight for the title again. His camp's pretty unhappy with that whole Aldo knockout, grabbing the fence and turning himself around. Um, you had the tough smashes finales. Both of them going to unanimous decision. Uh, Norman Park defeating Colin Freakshow Fletcher to win the lightweight title. And Robert Whitaker defeating Brad Smith uh, via UD to win the welterweight title. Um, I'm not not sure if both guys were Australian. Both guys from, from the UK, all of that. Are uh, you aware of who was what? I actually am. And I just want to make some notes real quick on those fights. I'm going to keep it real fucking simple. Yeltsin Meza would have a way better career if his name was Maltin Yeza, in my opinion. You switch the two letters. <laughs> you switch, you switch Y and M. Yeah, yeah. just hear me out. <laughs> so I feel with that name, he would have more com- uh, confidence in himself because he just sounds like an idiot with that name. Not surprising Chad Mendes won. Hector Lombard looked fantastic. Yet he was fighting a wounded animal. Pajares apparently broke his foot on one of those leg kicks that he was throwing. It was a hell of a fight. Puts him on the map. Um, so, you know, Lombard obviously should, you know, get a stiff test in his next fight. But it's going to be against a larger opponent again. And he seems to stumble against these, uh, you know, bigger middleweights with uh, that don't have padded records. Norman Park and Colin Freak Show Fletcher. Yeah, I watched the entire season of Smashes. I really wanted Freak Show to win. He's a fantastic human being. Funny as all hell. You know, this giant, you know, tatted up British guy who's pale as shit with a goofy face and he's got like a real funky style. Norman Park's boring as shit. So uh, it, it's really sad to see uh, that guy win. Definitely, yeah. Um, I haven't gotten to to the smashes yet, but I definitely want to get to that eventually. And hey, I have a lot of time off now that I'm graduated, unemployed, and homeless. <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, you got a... <clears throat> I got a... Home is where the heart is. <sighs> yeah, I'm uh, looking at it now. C- kind of freaky. Uh, in, in the welterweight bracket, the Aussies go 5-2. Five for five and 2 uh, get a Aussie champion in Robert Whitaker. And in the lightweight bracket... The the Brits go six and one, and you get a Brit British uh, winner at Norman Park. So uh, domination on either side, but yeah. So uh, Norman Park and Robert Whitaker are your tough smashes champions, and let's let's get to to the two fights that people were talking about. Mainly um, Hector Lombard defeating Husamir Palhares. A lot of people were questioning Lombard in the UFC. Tim Boach kind of took him apart. Uh, that was your classic bull versus the bear matchup, and the bear wins every time. Um, Lombard just, you know, was going for that home run shot, and Boach really kind of quelled him with with dominant footwork, dominant wrestling, and uh, <clears throat> and this Paul, Paul Harris fight kind of brought his stock back up, finished him in the first round. Where do you think this puts Lombard in the middleweight division? Who do you see him fighting next? Well, I definitely see him being pushed hard by the UFC. I actually read an article on Hector Lombard, and apparently he has a $300,000 a fight guarantee as well as a piece of the backbone of the pay-per-view. So it was a big-time deal for the UFC to bring him over. They thought they had a legit contender for Anderson Silva, and he stumbled against uh, Tim Bosch. You know, he should have won that fight, but, you know, he didn't. So, um, 
man, as far as who he should fight next, how about the winner of Alan Belcher versus Yushin Okami? That makes most sense to me. I like that. Um, you know, both of them have, have kind of varying styles. I'm really interested to see who wins that fight. But, uh, yeah, um, for uh, the sake of breathing, breezing through this and, and liking that uh, matchup, I will agree with that. Um, and let's go to, to the main event, the two coaches, which I don't know. I think this is the first time we've ever seen two coaches actually fight each other on the finale. I know it's slated for um, <clears throat> also for the Nelson Carwin uh, match, but obviously Carwin dropping out from injury. Um, and Ross Pearson defeating George Sotteropoulos. Third round TKO. He almost finished him in the first round and second round. Um, Pearson looking... I uh, <clears throat> was uh, watching it and thought thought he was Dennis Seaver. I don't know why, but but he had the Seaver cut, and I and I looked up. I was like, is that Dennis? Oh no, it's Ross Pearson. It's Pearson. It may have just been because I had a horrible reception where I was watching it, but um, yeah, it looked really impressive. Put it to Sotoropoulos. would have won the uh, decision easily, but uh, really, really dominated him. What's happened to George Sotoropoulos? He looked so good back when he, he was on that tear just a couple of years ago. Since then, he's lost a few fights and has really fallen off the face of the map as far as the lightweight title picture goes. Yeah, um, fuck. Uh, it, it's, it, for me, like this fight, I actually originally thought that this fight was at featherweight, ended up being at lightweight. All I can really say about this fight is that George Sotoropoulos has lost three in a row. Uh, one dominating decision loss, two finishes. Um, I think he's done, man. I think he's done. Uh, his chin just can't hold up. Ross Pearson looked great, had a great, great game plan. He didn't look uh, as drawn out as he was at featherweight, so I think it's a good move for him to go back up at lightweight. For the life of me, I've already forgot your initial question, so I hope I answered it. <laughs> That's what, uh, where I'm at. What has happened to uh, Sotoropoulos? Oh, um... Like I said, man, too much damage, whether you can attribute that to him getting older and, you know, he just can't take the punches, too much punishment in his career, or even gym wars. You know, a lot of the time you take most of your punishment in the gym. His chin just can't hang anymore. For sure. Um, And, you know, I still think maybe he has a little more life in him. Uh, Seaver, Dos Anjos, and Pearson are all top guys. Dos Anjos is in my top ten. Seaver is in my top five at featherweight. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just I want to see him fight maybe a C level guy and see if if he's able to get back up to you know strangling people instead of losing these tough decision or not not uh, decisions but just getting really really out outworked. Um, yeah, he's become like a pseudo boxer, right? He's just willing to stand with everyone when yeah. he shouldn't be. He should just start kicking people in the nuts again, like he did Shinya Aoki. Didn't know that happened, but I hate Shinya, so I like it. Yeah, he uh, that was his second loss back in Shudo in '06. Uh, he lost via DQ for a groin strike. Sorry, Shinya. I I hope it was with his chin <laughs> from probably, full guard. <laughs> it probably was. He just did did a whiplash move. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, before we move on to, to the other tough finale, do you think Pearson's a threat at lightweight? I certainly do not. Um, I think he is a solid B level guy. He'll probably win some, uh, decent fights, but, uh, every time he ascends to that upper echelon, he, uh, falls short. I mean, beating up Dennis Seaver at lightweight and Spencer Fisher. I mean, yeah, it is impressive, but, uh, you know, Seaver's always been a natural featherweight, and Fisher was on his decline. I do not see him ascending. Yeah, and it's kind of uh, kind of curious. He uh, went down to a featherweight for two fights, and after Cub Swanson gave him his lunch money, he's, he sort of just backed away. It was like, eh, I don't think I'm all about this featherweight. Return to lightweight. He should return to a featherweight, but either way, I do agree with you. Um, just, you know, is is really good at standing up. He actually has a black belt in Taekwondo, a brown belt in Judo, a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. All of those impressive, but he doesn't have that wrestling base like a lot of guys, especially in that 145, 155 realm do. Um, and I don't know if his stand-up is enough to make up for that lack. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, you want to go to the American Tough Finale, Tough 16 Finale, I believe? 
I'll take that as a yes. You there, man? I'm assuming you're there still. Um, hoping you're there. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll uh, go go straight to uh, Mike Kyle defeating James Head. My boy, James Head. Um, I had a lot of stock in him. But, um, yeah, just wasn't able to, to keep the run going. There he is. Where'd you go? I'm here. I'm here. Hi. <laughs> I uh, posed a, a question and just, just, just got a silence back. So, uh, yeah, you ready to, to go to the Tough 16 finale? I was born ready, sir. Born ready to do that shit. Um, Mike Kyle defeating James Head. I had a, I had a twist. Mike, Mike Pyle, by the way. I hate to interrupt you. Mike Kyle is oh. a light heavyweight in Strike Force. <laughs> yeah, I think I just, just kind of breezed through that. Mike I was Pyle. like, when did Mike Kyle face James Head? <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Mike Pyle, who I really think is the most underrated fighter in the UFC, um, coming off three great wins. Uh, defeating James Head, who I had a lot of stock in. James Head defeating Brian Ebersol recently. Uh, Pyle now with, I believe, three straight first-round knockouts or TKOs. He's actually the first welterweight in UFC history to ever string together three straight first-round TKOs or KOs God against. Damn, that's impressive. Yeah, against Ricardo Funch, Josh Neer, and James Head now. Um, his last loss coming to Rory McDonald at UFC 153. I think he's the most underrated fighter in the UFC. What about you? I don't think he's underrated. What I feel is that he's changed his training camp. He talked about it after getting his, uh, you know, shit pushed in by Rory McDonald. He changed, he, uh, changed up his training camp. He went away from, uh, Extreme Couture. And he's put together an awesome streak. Even in the UFC, his only losses are to Larson, uh, Ellenberger, and McDonald. And he's put McDonald his... pushed uh, Rory pushed his shit back into him when he was pooping right. in a stall. He's trying he to ran poop. in there and bent him over and took all the poop and shoved it back and he in. He shoved it back in with ground and pound. Just... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, beyond See, that, we keep it very professional. Yeah, beyond that, uh, he's 37 years old. I do not think that he will um, put it all together against a top 10 fighter. If you tell me that Mike Pyle is going to beat Ellenberger or Hendricks or Condit or Diaz or any of these guys, you're out of your mind. There's no way. He looks really good against some decent fighters. I think James Head is his most impressive victory inside the octagon. And James Head is only, what, two fights in welterweight? So, absolutely not. I don't think he will. You know, I think he's really underrated. Just because just, just you look at his record, one of the few guys, I think he has, uh, you know, his uh, UFC record is something like 7-3. and three. Um, identical record to to Nate Quarry, who we had on a few weeks ago. Definitely check that interview out. Seven and three. Uh, you know the losses to Larson Ellenberger and McDonald since joining the UFC. Um, just one of these really good guys. He was on the undercard of the goddamn tough finale. Like, come on, man. He, he him fighting is, I think, m- more more notable than Barry Del Rosario, than Poyer Brookins, and, uh, yeah, I I think the UFC brass and fans alike kind of, uh, underrate him, um, and, and yeah, we'll, uh, swing through those other two fights real quick as well, Dustin Poyer defeating Jonathan Brookins via Darce Choke at 415 around one, Dustin Diamond looking like he's, uh, getting, getting back into it. Um, it was actually funny on, uh, the MMA hour, I was listening to Ariel and, uh, he asked, yeah, you know, are you Dustin the Diamond because of the guy, you know, Screech off Saved by, by the Bell is named Dustin Diamond. It's like, oh yeah, I never really thought of that. He's like, oh yeah, that's what I thought it was. What, what does Diamond come, come from? I don't know. What do you mean, you know? Well, I was going to sign up for my first fight, and my manager and nickname just just put Diamond. He thought that sounded cool. <laughs> he was like, wow, that's the most <laughs> non-climactic story I've heard of a nickname ever. Um, Pat Barry, HD Hyper Die, defeating Shane Del Rosario via KO, which I'm sure most people were really ha- happy to see. He's one of the more colorful people, and no, I don't mean that racially. Um, in, but you should. In, but I should mean it racially. Um, Barry defeating Shell, Shane Del Rosario via KO 
uh, punches round two, 26 seconds in. I don't think this puts him at elite heavyweight level at all, but at least he's still hanging in there. Um, for a while there, it was unknown whether or not he would get cut or not. I think he suffered a four-fight losing streak. Lo- or no, he uh, lost three of four. He lost to uh, lost to Crow Cop, uh, Congo, Struve, and LeVar Johnson, all within about a year or two of each other. Um, yeah, so I'm glad that Pat Barry is going to stay in the heavyweight division and all of that. Uh, you want to talk about the tough finale, Colton Smith versus Mike Ricci? I sure as hell don't. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a pretty boring fight. Unanimous hey, uh, decision. Colton Smith just dominated Ricci. Can I at least talk about Poirier versus Brookens real quick? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. So that was a fantastic performance, man. Um, Poirier, you know, he's a top flight featherweight, and he looks really bad against uh, Jonathan Brookens in that opening spot where he decided to, like, plant himself against the cage and throw against Brookens. Bad move. Brookens isn't exactly a um, dynamic striker. He's more basic, but the fact that he wasn't angling out or using head movement and was just trading with him, I thought that was dumb for a guy that's coming off of a crushing loss against the Korean Zombie. But that being said, to come back and sub out Jonathan Brookens with the same choke that Korean Zombie got on him, that shows you that he has resolve, he has, you know, staying, you know, ability, and he has uh, you know, that comeback power. So that was fantastic, man. I I'm really a huge fan of the diamond. I think that he is back on track, and I also feel that he's one of my favorite uh, featherweights in the UFC division. Yeah, recently moving. I believe he moved from uh, where he was training in Louisiana down to Florida at Coconut Creek to train with the ATT guys. Um, on that same interview I mentioned on, on the MMA Hour, said he was tired of being the big fish in a little pond. Uh, you know, he's he's uh, from Louisiana originally, was fighting out of Lafayette, and uh, now he's over at a- ATT in Florida, training with he's a bunch of BTC. top guys. What? He's at BTC, man. What's BTC? Uh, black Top uh, Control. Um, black Top Vigils. Control. I actually used to uh, go go to a gay bar called Black Top Control. I know, I know you've told me about it. <laughs> Those were the good old days. Um, <clears throat> Jesus Christ. Lots it of sailors. It, it doesn't take much for us to get homoerotic. Um, <clears throat> fucking A. Uh, yeah, just... You know he's he he's got a real impressive record. Uh, he's six and one. This is that loss coming to Chan Sung Jung uh, in May of this year, which was still fight of the night. It was an amazing fight. Um, it was a a, a five rounder uh, that Chan Sung Jung won in the fourth round via Doris Choke. Really, really amazing fight. I'd I'd, I'd like to uh, see a rematch of that maybe one day down the road. But yeah, just just looking at that uh, division real quick, do you think uh, Dustin's close to a title shot? I certainly don't. Uh, there's lots of guys in front of him, and he's coming off of a crushing loss, which made him cry in the post-fight interview. <laughs> hey yo, uh, yeah. I also think that there uh, there's a swarm of guys above him, namely you know you got Seaver, Ricardo Lamas, Nunez, Cub Swanson, Chad Mendez. Obviously, the Korean Zombie. Uh, you, you, you even could could argue that guys like Peralta and Elkins have worked their way up past him uh, with recent victories. So, uh, yeah, we'll we'll see where uh, the diamond goes from here and whether he can get himself back up. You know, before that Zombie loss, they were saying the winner of that, which I don't understand why. Uh, you you don't hear Chan Sung Jung's name thrown around more when you talk about potential. Uh, potential number one contenders to fight Jose Aldo, because he looked game fighting Dustin Poirier. Um, so, Dude, yeah, you're, you know. you're actually wrong, by the way. Eric Koch was scheduled to face uh, Dustin Damien Poirier, and then Koch pulled out with injury, and uh, Korean Zombie oh, stepped really? in. Yes, so still, Koch, still, though. Koch, Koch, I mean, just think about it. Koch was in the name of the title talk. And he's had two fights in the UFC, uh, beating Brookens and Asuncao before that fight was announced. So literally, if he beat Dustin, that would be three fights in the UFC, and he would have had a title shot against Aldo. Yeah, so why why not put Korean Zombie in that same light after he beats Poyer? Oh, I agree, man. I agree. I think KZ 
is uh, someone that's not in the talks. He's lined up for a fight. I'm not sure what it is. I thought it was uh, Ricardo Lamas, but that's been scrapped. I'm not sure what's going on with the guy. Uh, I don't think he has a fight lined up now as uh, well. Dude, uh, dude, dude's actually only fought one time in 2012. Uh, fought twice in 2011, beat Leonard Garcia in that rematch. After that uh, BS decision at WEC 48, he got that twister submission. Uh, Knocked out Mark Hominick in seven seconds. 2011 was a great year for a Korean Zombie with that seven-second knockout and that second-round twister with a second to go. Um, but you know he just isn't getting out there and fighting as much as he needs to. You know since I agree. since since he knocked out Hominick a little over a year ago, that Poyer fights his only fight. He's he's got to be fighting more often than once every 12 months. Um, and yeah, we'll. Uh, yeah, Colton Smith, uh, really... Colton Smith, a, who gives a shit, a, moving a dominant, on. Fuck dominant that guy. wrestler. <laughs> um, dominant wrestler. I still think we'll, we'll, we'll see both guys make an impact. But I was rooting for Ricci, who, even though he was Canadian, he was the more dominating fighter. And a hipster. A sad and hipster. a hipster. He and Rory like to listen to the Wallflowers and the Hives and other hipster band like that. Bands like the that. Jesus Jeez. Christ, I can't even... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, heavyweight match, Roy Nelson versus Matt Mitrione. First round, three minutes in. You could tell Nelson was batting for the cages, or batting for the cages. What the fuck am I saying tonight? Batting for the fences. Was, uh, Komodo dragoning for the uh, football field. You could tell he was... I was. I don't even know what I was even going to say that. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, god damn it. We, we take a week off, and we're back to square one, ladies and gentlemen. No, but, um... Welcome back, welcome back. back. Um, yeah, Nelson defeating Matt Mitrio in the first round, swinging for the fences, looked pretty good, and Mitrio did a decent job kind of avoiding it until three minutes in. Nelson, you, you've you got to put him on the top five, top ten list of hardest hitters in the UFC, because he's, he's, he's one of those guys, if he lands a punch flush, you're going down. Of course you're going down, man. That guy has an incredible swing. Uh, my only issue with Nelson is that he got dominated by fighters such as, uh, you know, fucking Junior Dos Santos as well as Fabricio Verdum. And yeah, they are the cream of the crop. I don't ever see Nelson contending for a title. You know, there was a time where he was campaigning for a fight with Brock Lesnar. And at the time I was like, oh, Nelson would get destroyed. I look back on it now and go, yeah, he could have beat the shit out of Brock Lesnar. Um, but as far as the current state of heavyweights in the UFC, I don't see Nelson ever, ever getting to a number one contender fight. He's going to look real, real good against solid guys, and he's going to fall from grace against some of the better fighters. It's been proven, and um, you know, as much as uh, I hate to say it, he's never, ever going to contend for that title. No, and and you know, yeah, he 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 defeated Stefan Struve, which was kind of the highlight of his career to to this date. But since then, the guy's three and three. He's knocked out three guys who had no business being in the cage with him in Crow Cop, Dave Herman, and Matt Mitrione. The other three fights, all decision losses to Junior Dos Santos, Frank Mir, and Fabricio Verdum. All three oh, I of forgot those, about that Frank Mir fight. That was embarrassing. All three of those losses were beatdowns. I think all all three were 30-27, 30-26s across the board. Um, he didn't come close to winning a round of any of those fights. Just was completely out outclassed. I actually had had an exchange exchange with him after uh, Velasquez Dos Santos won on uh, Twitter. He, even though I like the guy, he seems like a nice dude, colorful as all hell. But he was saying after Dos Santos knocked out Velasquez, he's like, I want the next shot. He knocked out Velasquez in 38 seconds. I went 15 minutes with him. Like, dude, just because you can't get knocked out doesn't mean you had a chance of ever beating him. He's like, so I stayed in there long. I was like, oh, I don't want to get in an argument with you, Roy, but you got to look at the facts. And the facts are that you got completely outclassed by all three of those top guys, and, yeah, you know, just just, just not the sort of uh, acumen that you need to be an elite guy. 
he's one of these elite gatekeeper guys. It would be interesting to maybe see him fight Josh Barnett after they, they bring him over from Strike Force. Maybe fight Shane Carwin. Um, <clears throat> there was a lot of build up to that. Maybe fight I don't know. Maybe fight the uh, winner of Mark Hunt and Stefan Struve. Uh, maybe see Struve get a chance for redemption. Nelson Hunt would would be a pretty pretty fun match. Just just because I'm sure there's. Uh, there's lots of fat guys who would be happy to see both of those bellies in the cage together. But, uh, yeah, just... Me, me as well, dude. I want to see belly love. I want to see that sweet belly loving. But, yeah, versus a guy, you know, I'm I'm uh, looking now at, at, at the top heavyweights. I don't think he has a shot in hell against any of them. Dos Santos, Kane, Overeem, Cormier, Verdum, Mir... Bigfoot Silva, even I think all those guys would smash Nelson, and he's you know one of these rare guys who, when he fights a guy who's better than him, he gets absolutely manhandled. But when he fights a guy who's just as good as him or may, maybe a little worse, he just knocks him the fuck out. It's either one I, or the other. I agree with you one hundred percent. The only issue I have with your breakdown is Bigfoot Silva. I think Roy Nelson would put that guy to sleep quick. That guy has a chin made of sand. <laughs> like, I mean, really, Daniel Cormier, a fucking, you know, natural light heavyweight, knocked him out, and he got completely dominated by Kane Velasquez. I think Roy Nelson could beat that guy. Everyone else on the list I agree with, but I think Bigfoot would get a uh, get a KO victory in that That one. guy, this guy. I mean, yeah. get KO. Yeah, I, I guess I could see that as well, but, um, yeah, <sighs> Three fight cards broken down. You have anything else to to add on uh, that tough finale or any of them? Sorry, I asked that one more time. You broke up. Do you have any el- anything else you want to go over? Oh, on, hell no. uh, Okay, nope. cool. Yep, uh, we had a lot of making up to do, but we have done it. Uh, if you want to call in, the number is 213-457-3380. Tweet us at the MMA Podcast. I got that up. Visit our website, themmapodcast.com, which I will admit uh, the last few weeks I was real busy with that internship, graduation bullshit. I'm going to um, work really hard to update that daily and make it something where instead of having you know three or four stories put up, you know, once or twice a week. I'm uh, really going to try and add one or two stories to that at least every day. So uh, definitely, ke- definitely keep your eyes up on that. Chris will start con- con- contributing to um, if he you know gets he gets off that meth addiction. Uh, wait, but, wait, wait. You thought you were going to slide what? one in under the rug? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Never touched it. Never will, cocksucker. Motherfucker. You ready to get to the news? Yeah. Let's do it. And uh, yeah, really the uh, first thing to to broach with, oh shit, word on the street tweeting us at the MMA podcast, how the hell did you guys skip over the Mike Pierce versus Seth Bazinski ski 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 battle? That's actually really true. Uh, that was that was an awesome fight. Pierce, much much shorter than Basinski. How the fuck you say his name? Uh, really went out there and beat beat the Christ out of him. But you know what, Ramses, uh, we told you were asked to call in. You could have called in and talked about it. But we've been off two weeks. We can't. You know, we're already an hour and a half in. We can't spend Not two hours man. just breaking down fights, Ramses. Come on, son. But yeah, we'll we'll mention it. That what was you doing? a you what are you doing? Goose cooked cocksucker. Um, yeah, that, uh, that, that actually was a real amazing fight. Uh, really, really cool to see Pierce do work on him. I think, no, it didn't, didn't get any fight of the might, fight of the night bonuses, but, uh, yeah, that was, that was a cool, cool match. Um, so yeah, goose cooked cocksucker. And if you want to tweet us, you're listening live, uh, then fucking tweet us and I will read that shit on air. God damn it. Um, <clears throat> the news. Welterweight matches made for UFC 158. Three fucking awesome. I, I can't remember a card maybe other than UFC 146 with the heavyweights that was so stacked when it came to one single division. Um, this, you, you, you literally have six of the top, arguably the top six welterweights going at it. 
I I can't think of any other welterweights in the UFC at least. You know, maybe Nate Marquardt. Other than that, I guess Martin Campman. Um, you know, these these are six top guys all going at it at UFC 158, March 16th in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. I'm pumped for I'm pumped as fuck for this fight. What about you, man? Dude, I'm pumped. I uh, actually had the chance to send this to my buddy Corey Sandoval. Shout out Ventura, California, recently. And his reaction was just a, a, a gaped mouth, just oh, oh, <laughs> you know. So breaking out the Vanderlei impression. Oh, obrigado, obrigado, no respeite. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, but uh, fucking, how can you not be excited for this like six man tournament? Essentially, is what you got. You got Saint Pierre Diaz, Hendrix Ellenberger, Condit McDonald. All these guys have the rights to either owning a title or fighting for it. It is absolutely fantastic. It's the unofficial six man welterweight tournament of uh, 2013. Yeah, it really is. Um... I uh, <clears throat> think, you know, this Rory versus Condit fight, probably the winner will be in a position to have a number one title contendership fight. Hendricks versus Allenberger is a number one title con- contendership fight. Uh, and St. Pierre Diaz, that's the title fight. You know, even though I really think Hendricks should be in there instead of Nate Diaz, it makes perfect sense. You give the winner of Condit McDonald, Nate Marquardt, those two guys fight for the title. And then you have the winner of St. Pierre Diaz and Hendricks Ellenberger fight for the title, the welterweight division that was pretty crowded, kind of setting itself up nicely. Um, and if Rory does win his next two fights against Condit and assumingly Marquardt or somebody else for the title contendership match, that would give GSP the perfect reason to um, move up to, to middleweight. The two stri- tri-star guys have said under no circumstances would they ever fight each other. So, you know, that's... Bullshit. Dana White comes up with his checkbook and that goes out the window. Hey, how about I write you this check for five million dollars? Yeah, it's, that's that's uh, very true. But um, you know, sort of like it it was with uh, Koscheck and Fitch, like it is with Leoto and Anderson. I have a feeling that we we never see these guys fight. And as 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 much as Dana White would be busting out his checkbook for that, he's really going to be busting out his checkbook for GSP Silva. So maybe he'll see it as a reason to finally get GSP to move up to a middleweight. And GSP said that that move would be a permanent one. Um, so uh, yeah, let's uh, really quick go go through these um, March 16th fights. We'll go over them more in depth the week the, the Wednesday before the fight. But uh, at least now, let's let's just give them a look. Uh, we'll start from the top and go to the bottom. Saint Pierre versus Diaz. I think Saint Pierre, like like he mentioned on UFC tonight, is going to use that Henderson style to quell Nick Diaz, just like he did Nate. Um, it's going to be an awesome build up. You know, your quintessential bad but bad guy versus good guy. And uh, I have GSP all day in this one. What about you? Um. G- GSP versus Diaz. I'll tell you what, Diaz is coming off a long layoff. He's going to have the cardio to back everything up, but his biggest problem is that St. Pierre came back, rallied back, and took that flush head kick that Diaz could never do, and he soldiered on like a soldier. Like and he a came soldier. in there. And even though he looked less mobile, you got to think that St. Pierre was tentative after all that time off. It's ring rust. His next fight, I would pity anyone who would be in there with him. Even if Johnny Hendricks stepped in with St. Pierre instead of Diaz, I would still give St. Pierre a slight edge based off of the fact that he's one of the smartest fighters in the UFC and he got his feet wet again, man. Like, you know, he hadn't been snorkeling in a year and a half and he finally put the fins on and jumped out in the ocean and he came back the victor against adversity. So I got St. Pierre, sir. Indeed. Uh, <clears throat> Johnny Hendricks, Jay Gallenberger, kind of similar styles. You got guys based in wrestling with big hands. But I think Hendricks, a little bit better of a wrestler, a lot better of a striker. Um, you know, Ellenberger couldn't put down Campman. Hendricks did it in, what, 36 seconds? It didn't take long at all. Um, I have Hendricks via, just just like I called it in the Campman fight, Hendricks, first round, knockout. Bueno. Bueno. 
Carlos Conde at Roy McDonald, I think this is sort of the most intriguing one stylistically, um, because <clears throat> Rory was close to a decision victory against Carlos Conde if it wasn't for that third round where Conde really turned it around and uh, put him on his back and fucking just destroyed him. I mean, Jesus Christ, did I look like he was... You uh, know when, like, you stomp on grapes to make wine? It was like he was oh, doing with that with his fists to Rory McDonald's face. Just mashing it up into a nice puree. Um, <clears throat> really, really hammering McDonald. <sighs> I, you know, I want to give it to to Rory. I, you know, he really, really did impress me, but Carlos Condit is, is is just one of these guys who's a straight finisher. I say we see a Carlos Condit finish. I like that, and I wanted to kind of broach an interesting uh, kind of observation here. Rory McDonald has never, ever been out-wrestled, except for his fight with Carlos Condit. Carlos Condit never wrestled in high school, but I'll tell you what, he trained mixed martial arts from age 13 so now he's 27, 28, something like that. So you got over a decade of pure MMA experience. He out-wrestled Jake Ellenberger. He took Jake Ellenberger's best right hand, and he soldiered on, and he beat Jake Ellenberger. So what does that say to me? That says that Carlos Condit is the ultimate mixed martial arts weapon, this side of you know Anderson, St. Pierre, GSP. John Jones. Yeah, exactly. All these guys. He is the kind of guy that never had these high school accolades, but he didn't give a shit. He went out and he improved himself in the martial arts of mixed martial arts. And I'll tell you what, I think he has Rory McDonald's number. I think Rory is going to have an awesome first round. Second round is going to slide in Conant's favor. And just like the first time, Conant's going to get that third round finish. For sure. Um, <clears throat> you know what, and, and just for the sake of playing devil's advocate, I think when you look at that that fight, that's that's one of those fights you look at it and 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 you think, all right, if those guys fought ten times, it would probably be five and five. Condit would win it five times. McDonald would win it five times. If if anyone were to win it more times, I'd, I'd honestly say Rory McDonald, because he you know dominated the first two rounds of that fight. Um, you know, it's all. All about who has progressed more since the uh, fight. They fought what in 2010. Was, yeah, they did. That, it was. Uh, I think it was. I think it was April or May. Yeah, June, June June 2010 at oh, UFC June. one okay. UFC 115, which was uh, headlined by Liddell and Franklin. Wow. Yep. Um. <clears throat> yeah. You know. And it's hard. It was fight of the night, and it was in British Columbia, where Rory's from, uh, in in Vancouver. Looking at who's progressed more, I don't really think I can give the edge to either guy. Uh, Rory Mack and Carlos have both progressed a great deal. Obviously, Condit was training extremely hard, became a much better fighter in the lead up to that GSP fight. But uh, Rory has has youth on his side, and I say in a couple of years, I'll uh, go ahead and flip-flop for the sake of being devil's advocate. I say in 2010, if they fight 100 times, Rory wins that 55. Now in 2012, they they fight 100 times, Rory McDonald wins 60 or 70 times. Um, And that... I'll I'll tell you what, man. I'm not discounting Rory McDonald. He is fantastic. He has bulldog strength. Yeah, not only is he fucking strong, but his striking technique, I went on a couple forums, and a lot of people said he looked, like, too tight, you know, he looked too tense, but God damn it, did he look awesome against BJ. I mean, he was throwing six, seven strike combinations, and that right there is the sign of a great striker. He broke out the Ollie shuffle. Can't be looser yeah. than that. Yeah, that too. So I think that Rory McDonald has ascended to that next level since that fight. And that was the, the kind of fight that lit a fire under his ass. But the thing about Condit that makes me put more stock into him is that he's got the jassing... J- sorry, jazz... He has the jazzing. He's, he's got such jazz, jazz skills. Jazz he's really good with jazz music. He's, he's, uh, he's so good. Jazz hands, Rory. Uh, you still there? You cut off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He uh, he's really, really good with the uh, the unpredictability. He has spinning strikes. He strikes in the knee, and uh, he's absolutely fantastic. So I would have to say that Condit is uh, my favorite for this fight. 
True that, um, <clears throat> and we will see whether Rory will be able to uh, avenge his only loss. The loss, he says, still haunts him to this day. Um, yeah, uh, another couple of fights I wanted to broach. I was saying, uh, because I couldn't find the, our little run sheet we go off. Seaver Swanson made for the February uh, England card. Uh, this is going to be a real fun fight. I think it could be for uh, number one contendership against Aldo Edgar. Both of them are at the top of the featherweight division. Cub Swanson coming to... God, I keep fucking burping. This is pissing me off. I swear to God, I never burp. It's pissing me off. Yeah, it's pissing me off. It's pissing our listeners off. It's pissing Ramsey's off. Everyone's mad. Ramsey, stop getting pissed. Um, Swanson coming off three wins to George Roop, Ross Pearson, Charles Oliveira, all KO or TKO stoppages. Dennis Seaver, uh, he's on a real impressive, impressive streak, uh, since moving to featherweight, 2-0. and He was on a four-win lightweight streak before losing to Donald Cerrone and dropping down right afterwards. And he beat two real good guys in Diego Nunez and Nam Fan. This will be a test for him, though. Uh, you know, he has sort of a stiff striking style. He's, he's, he's got that kickboxing, uh, Sambo kind of German, uh, technique. He's, he's 5'7", only has a reach of 70 inches, while Cub Swanson has a, uh, has a, I, identical, uh, frame. He's 5'7", with a reach of 70 inches, so that's even, uh, who you got in this one, bro? Fuck, that is a great question. Uh, if it was pre Nam fan fight, you know, with with uh, Seaver, I would say Swanson all day. But goddamn, did fucking Dennis Seaver look amazing against uh, Nam fan? Fucking Nam fan is no pushover at all. So it for me, this fight is very closely contested. Uh, what you have to look at is uh, Cub Swanson being a finisher and Dennis Seaver not being a finisher. He couldn't finish Diego Nunez. He couldn't finish Nam Fan. Whereas Swanson has finished Roop as well as, uh, you know, who else here? Help me out. He finished uh, Oliveira and uh, a British Pearson. guy. Pearson. <laughs> yeah, we just talked about him. So um, Dennis Seaver's best weapons are his unchambered kicks where most guys load up on a kick. He just throws it karate style. And he actually leans in and out with strikes, so he can chain together these crazy striking, you know, techniques. Because he's not putting full force into it, but he's doing enough to do damage, as well as his spinning back kick. So that being said, I have to say that Cub Swanson will finish Dennis Seaver just for the fact that he is athletic, fast, and explosive enough to get out of the way of all those things and land that knockout blow. I got Swanson by finish in this fight. I have Dennis Seaver in this fight. Um, <clears throat> you know, Swanson. Swanson is close to to putting everything together, but I just am not sure whether he's put put all of it together yet. The last three guys that he's faces have questionable chins. Uh, Root Pearson and Oliveira. Uh, just and and the Oliveira fight, obviously. Uh, or at least in my opinion, Oliveira is the top guy out of that, and he he was draining himself out. Oliveira actually missed weight, tried to get as low as he could, could only get down to 146.4, so he he cut in incorrectly, was was not at top shape for that fight. And you know, you look look back at his UFC premiere. Uh, he fought Ricardo Lamas, and Lamas really kind of put it to him with that second round submission. And Dennis Seaver, you know, he you've 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 got to go go back, to, you know, going back to March 2010. His only loss was that submission to Donald Cerrone, who, in my opinion, is one of the best lightweights in the world. I actually see Dennis Seaver. Um, been uh, training up up in uh, Germany. I uh, believe he uh, trains trains over there. Uh, just really, really starting to put it all 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 together. And a lot of you know, usually we see mostly just kickboxing and these spinning back kicks. But he had really impressive boxing and really impressive wrestling against Nam Fan. And I don't know if he's 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 gonna have that uh, glass chin like Cub Swanson's last few opponents have. I don't know if Cub Swanson's gonna be able to rush in there and get that, you know, early KO TKO victory. And the longer the fight goes, I think Seaver's just gonna grind Swanson out and uh, maybe take a decision. 
Well, that's a very well aptly put, uh, you know, breakdown, and I do disagree. But shit, it comes down to fight night, doesn't it? <laughs> That's very true, very true. Um, one more uh, one more topic, then we'll get to our 10 solid seconds of sports. Brian Stan versus Vanderlei Silva. Stan, uh, one and two in his last three, losses to Bisping and Sonnen with a win. KO, first round win against Alessio Sakara in the middle of those two. Vanderlei Silva, um, <clears throat> he himself also one and two in his last three, uh, two and three. Two and four in his last six. Um, you now, just both of these these guys, sort of not. I don't want to say falling off the map, but just not looking impressive. Actually, uh, kind of funny. Both of them were at middleweight. Both of them are going to be moving up. This is going to be a light heavyweight bout. Brian Stan Vanderlei Silva. I, I guess both of them just sort of, you know, thought, hey, if we're going to fight each other at middleweight, let's uh, let's let's give each other a break and fight at 205 or more comfortable. We don't have to cut down ridiculously. Hey, let's not get aggressive with it. Let's yeah. just have a good, nice fight. <laughs> which, which, if any match this this would ha- happen with, it would be Stan versus Silva. Both of them are, you know, reportedly such nice dudes. Um, but uh yeah word I, on the street word on the street podcast dot gov um <clears throat> I see Brian Stan winning this uh you know yeah he did lose to Bisming and Sonnen but those are arguably top 5 middleweights when Vanderlei Silva lost to Lieben and Franklin I don't want to you know knock Franklin or Lieben obviously who we've had on the show but uh they aren't exactly Bisming and Sonnen I think Stan has uh has a very threatening game standing up, and it's interesting to note that I don't know if we've ever seen uh, Brian Stan get finished by punches. Actually, I'm looking now. Steve Cantwell finished him back in 08. But that That's was true. The That's how Cantwell got his title. What's his title? Oh, yeah, the WEC, WEC. title. I was like, yeah. is he now called Sir... <laughs> he, he incorporates people's names into his name. He's like, I am now Steve... Brian Stan Cantwell. <laughs> <laughs> he takes your soul, bro. But uh, yeah, Stan. I just see. I'm. Um, I'm not sure if Stan's younger. I know he doesn't have 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 near the experience. Vanille Silva has 48 fights. He's 36. Let's see. Stan only has uh, 17 fights. 32. Wow. Stan's still pretty young. Um, and this will be the the card in Japan. Both these these guys uh, pretty popular in in Japan. Stan was actually born in Japan, believe it or not. But uh, I do. He's actually really good at calligraphy. He is awesome at calligraphy. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Stan Stan Vanderlei. Even though Vanderlei is one of my favorite fighters, just seeing them both fight. Stan seems more crisp, but God, you never fucking know with Vanderlei Silva nowadays. He he just comes out of the blue and knocks people out randomly. So I'm saying Brian Stan, but I'm not that you know I'm not not uh, all in on it, so to speak. Well, I'll tell you what, man. Uh, Vanderlei Silva is a legend, and let's look at styles here. Vanderlei does really poorly against unorthodox guys. When you look at Chris Lieben or Kung Lee, neither of them really throw their techniques how they should be thrown. And he got caught, um, you know, he got caught uh, in, in both those. Did I say Kung Lee? Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't mean Kung Lee. He beat Kung Lee. <laughs> uh, I guess for the sake thinking. of. Yeah, I, I guess for the sake of being caught with some huge punches by Kung Lee, he got caught by a spinning back fist. That, that's what I meant. I'm not saying he got knocked out by Kung Lee. He got caught by a spinning back fist. He got dropped. Chris Lieben polished him off in 27 seconds. Um, so against really unorthodox guys, he doesn't do that well, even if he wins. And then you got Brian Stan, who throws everything perfectly as far as uh, technique goes. Uh, he's really, really technically sound. He does kind of go into beast mode sometimes, but there's something about this fight. I'm going to say Brian Stan. I'm going to call that. Brian Stan wins. But there's something in uh, you know my heart that says that uh, Vonderlei is going to win by some crazy shit. <laughs> and uh, you know, I don't really care about being right or wrong. That's just how I feel. So I got Vonderlei in this one by a finish. 
hey, Vanderlei has got an amazing record in uh, Japan. Maybe he he can carry it on. Um, obviously had all those fights in Japan. I uh, think I actually looked at it a while ago, and he's something crazy like like. 21 and 2 in Japan or it's something. It's actually 210 and 3. Like oh, close. damn it. That was so close. At least in a lost column. Um, <clears throat> well, shit, man. You want to go to 10 solid seconds of spurts? Ask. Why even ask? Let's do it. Well, I've got to ask to make sure the pod runs super smooth. Hi, let's do it. All right. Speaking of super smooth, i got to pull up iTunes and play it because... I am sloppy as fuck. All right, let us do 10 solid seconds of sports. Why won't you minimize iTunes? I hate you. Notre Dame games looping up to prepare for the anal rape that is going to be the national championship game against Alabama. Both sides still still made it on the NHL lockout. Lakers still suck. Kobe putting up 70 shots a night. In the NFL season, two weeks left. Toronto Blue Jays. Josh Hamilton to the LA Angels. Ah, 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 oh, oh. <laughs> it sounded painful. Are you okay? <laughs> oh, God. I hope My you're okay My cum shots always are painful. It hurts. <laughs> and uh, speaking of Josh Hamilton going to the LA Angels, you better go see some of those games because those LA Angels are going to be ridiculous next season. So good, dude. I can't wait. I can't Sports. Wait. Fucking sports. Um, a few news briefs before we get into our last topic of the night. Bellator reviewing the UFC offer to Alvarez. They have the option to either match it or let him go. Derek Brunson replacing Carlos of Emola at UFC 155 what? to face Chris Lieben. Yep. I did not see that. What the hell? Derek Brunson uh, recently made news for, uh, I guess, he was going to be on The Ultimate Fighter and Showtime wouldn't let him. <laughs> Fucking such a dick move. Um, you know, getting in the way of a guy's career. Uh, the Marines get out of their UFC sponsorship. I don't know if it was something where they canceled or just didn't want to continue it. Alexander Emelianenko retires at 31. Patrick Cote drops to welterweight. And Ray Elby fractures his penis during training. Those have been news briefs, a segment for which we still don't have a drop. Uh, so yeah, one more uh, one more topic, and then my ras my raspy ass voice. You can probably tell I'm a little congested. Um, back in Florida, whenever you change environments, you know you 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 get fucked up a little bit. Um, and Chicago to Florida is definitely a change in environment. Uh, Ronda Rousey versus Liz Carmouche made for UFC 157. A lot of controversy kind of uh, swirling around it. I thought it was really weird that in in the press conference, Dana White said that they offered the fight to Misha Tate and Sarah McMahon, and both of them literally came out saying, uh, no, you didn't. You didn't offer this fight to us. What are you talking about? Um, Liz Carmouche stepping up, was saying she wants to fight Ronda Rousey. Uh, and, and and Dana White, you know, it's been been really weird. It's something that I really was hoping we wouldn't see. You know, when when you bring a new weight class in into your your promotion, you want to be all in on it. You want to say this is the women's 135 pound division. Uh, even after Rousey leaves, we're still going to keep it around. We got a lot of talent. We're really looking forward to to seeing who will hold 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 down the title. And instead, Dana White's just been kind of gray on it. Like, eh, we'll see what 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 happens with it. And I don't know if we'll 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 keep it around. This is a test, and I have no idea. And saying, "Damn right, it's the Rousey division," and all of this stuff. And look, I understand she's amazing. She is, you know, she is up she's up there with the greatest records in MMA history all all already having it you know by a strange risen, way strange way really kind of came on the scene about a year ago and has been just armboring the shit out of everybody what do you think oh, of uh, you want to fight me armbar you want to fight me armbar arm bar. oh you yeah. want to fight me all right armbar <laughs> it's kind of crazy she is the most dominant fight like she is anderson silva dominant she and anderson silva are the two most dominant fighters i've ever seen and that's saying something uh, what do you think of Dana sort of not being all in on on the division and just saying it's the Rousey show and all this? What do you you know think of think of his actions? I think that 
he is one of the smartest businessmen in history. There's a reason why mixed martial arts is one of the growing sports in the world and why the UFC is the most premier organization in the world. He has found his niche. He says what he wants to say and he calls it like he wants to call it. And I completely 100% see eye to eye with that. I do the same thing in my life. Ronda Rousey is a superstar. She's hot. She's buff. She armbars bitches, and the division is really, really slim. So to bring her in and, uh, you know, crown her without a fight, they've done that before with, you know, Jose Aldo. You know, they crowned her. I have no fucking problem with that, man. Who else is going to lead the charge for women's MMA? You would be kidding yourself if you thought that this UFC 157 pay-per-view with women on it would do better without Ronda Rousey. There's no way. You put Cyborg on there, most girls out there and go, ew, ah, gross. But you got Ronda Rousey. She's cute. You know, she's got a nice body, a nice butt, and she can fight like hell. So I completely co-sign. It is the Ronda Rousey show. And for Dan Henderson's camp to come out and say, oh, she hasn't paid her dues. You know, fuck you, man. They're trying to get a new market. Fuck that. And fuck you. She's awesome. And uh, that's where I basically end that rant. Protective of of Ronda Rousey, you know. <clears throat> we'll uh, get get to Dan Henderson's camp's remarks in a second, but I just you know Dana, you are right. He's a very very uh, very good businessman, but I just I'm not sure if I'm sold on him being back and forth on this women's division because him not you know if he isn't even going to dedicate Kate to it. I don't know what the fans will, and that's going to really be what decides the fate of women in the UFC, whether the fans follow it or not. And I don't know if you're going to be able to get a groundswell of support from your fans if the president can't even get 100% behind it. Hopefully, uh, hope, hopefully we do see Ronda Rousey because I am rooting for uh, women in uh, the UFC to you know go along and become something that we see more often, you know. A couple years ago, if you would have asked me, I would have been like, fuck women's MMA. I don't want to see that. It's like women's basketball. Women's basketball is absolutely horrible. But women's MMA is very, very interesting. You know, you uh, see techniques just as good as men's MMA. It isn't like it's a completely different sport like women's and men's basketball. It's MMA and, and a really, really, you know, it's 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 no different than watching lightweights fight. Uh, you know, you 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 have these super fast chicks, most of whom have really really great skill, and you know the the more supported, the more we have young women get involved in MMA and have you know these elite fighters like Ronda Rousey come out, and uh, you know I do think Ronda Rousey has a uh, smaller pool of contenders to deal with, you know where where in the middleweight division, you you probably have hundreds and hun- probably thousands. Yeah, you, yeah, you you probably easily have thousands of men competing in MMA at the 185 pound division. Whereas I'm not sure you have as many women fighting at 135 in mixed martial arts. But uh, you know what? If if anything, this is just going to make that more popular and get more women involved in the sport and just grow it even more. So I'm not really behind him just sort of half acidly, you know calling it an experiment. Come on, Dana. This is more than an experiment. And I have no no problems with you saying it's the Rousey show because you could call the UFC middleweight division the Anderson show, and I'd have no problem with it. She's dominating it. Just uh, be a little more behind it. Uh, <clears throat> kind of moving on to Rousey's opponent. Apparently, Cyborg was down to fight Ronda Rousey. She refuted the claims of her doctor, said no, no doctor ever told her that she couldn't drop down to 135. Um, which really kind of mixed me up because I'm pretty sure she came out and said her doctor said that. But either way, um, I had no idea her manager was Tito Ortiz. And I didn't, I didn't either until recently. That's nutty. Yeah. And what a dumb move. (laughs) What a horrible move. I mean, Tito Ortiz is the last person in the sport. I wouldn't want managing me, you know, I'm going to go out on my shield. Um, yeah, and he, he apparently blocked Chris Cyborg, uh, she was off of the fight and said, no, no, don't, don't take it. What a dumb move. Rousey, okay, A, Rousey is younger than Cyborg and arguably <clears throat> getting better 
at a quicker rate than Cyborg. So if I was Cyborg, I'd want to fight her as soon as possible. You know, you say you want to fight her down the line. Why not now? B, uh, you're, you're, you're coming off of this steroid suspension. What better way to make your notoriety you know, m- make sure you're back on the scene, then have this number one and number two fight and probably open the door for a rematch down the road because <coughs> I'm assuming uh, Rousey would put up more of a fight than Cyborg's ever seen and probably vice versa. Cyborg would put up more of a fight than Rousey's ever seen. I think that would be a barn burner of a fight and a great way to get people behind the UFC uh, women's bantamweight division. Uh, just... I have no idea why she wouldn't take the fight. Good question, man. Why Why wouldn't she? That's a great question. And uh, kind of in the history of this show, I'm going to say, who knows? I don't want to speculate, man. I mean, the last thing I want to do is come up with some crazy idea that doesn't come to fruition. So, I don't know. I have no idea. Why helicopters? If we had Ramsey's on, he would tell us Ramsey's? Why. Carlos Condit won that fight. Oh, wow. <laughs> Black Helicopters, Carlos Connett was paid $2.2 million to throw the fight against George St. Pierre. Um, one more, uh, one, one more topic I wanted to broach on the Rousey thing, and then we'll, uh, wrap it up and call it a show. Dan Henderson, like we were mentioning this camp, questioning it, questioning why they, they should headline UFC 157. Um, obviously Henderson and Machida will now be co-headlining and Rousey versus Carmouche <clears throat> will be head, head headlining before I throw in my, uh, two, two cents. Uh, you were talking about it earlier. Why don't you lead off? What do you mean? <laughs> like just talk about whether you think like Henderson's camp is, uh, in, in the right or in the wrong for questioning why Rousey should be headlining this card. Oh, well, obviously, Dan Henderson's camp wants him to have the biggest payday possible. And when you're a main event, you're going to be pushed uh, really hard, you know, on on, uh, any kind of Fox broadcast, you know, on Spike, you know, TV commercials. They push it really hard. So, of course, he's going to push for that. I don't blame him. Same thing with uh, Johnny Hendricks saying that uh, GSP is scared or Nick Diaz saying GSP is scared. Heart, heart scared. Yeah, like it. It makes sense to me, but do I agree with it? Fuck no, <laughs> like, dude. There's a pecking order, and if you think that you can go on Twitter or social media and call out somebody or say something that's going to make the president of the company change your mind, you're fucking stupid. They've already had it set. It's been set in stone. There's things in, that are moving in order, and you're not a part of that. And uh, for guys to get mad about that, I don't understand. That's like me going to work and thinking I'm the president of the company. Oh, fuck. Uh, yeah, I'm done uh, cleaning up theaters. I guess I'll just do paperwork. <laughs> like, it's stupid, man. I don't fucking get it. And that's the end of my rant. I don't get it either, man. Um, you know, yes, Dan, Dan Henderson and Leona Machida have, have more UFC history, but you know what? Ronda Rousey's a better fighter than both of you are right now. I'm sorry. Leoto, you just got your shit pushed back into your butt by John Jones and Dan... Yeah. Mike Pyle and Carlos Condit-esque. Exactly. And Dan, you know, even though Dan is is a great fighter, let's not not forget that time when Jake Shields dominated them dominated the fuck out of him in strike so force. embarrassing considering you look at Jake Shields now and you're like, "Really?" <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Uh, you know, just I I can see why you you would want to be on the the main card, but you've got to give it up to to the women. You know, I I think it's one thing for you to be like GSP and say, you know, like say <clears throat> say that you 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 don't personally like it that much, but you still respect it. But you know, it's 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 getting on on two levels of disrespect at this point, and um, I think Henderson and Machida just need to uh, chill the fuck out, especially Henderson's camp. I guess if he's the one calling it out. True enough, man. True enough. True enough, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, I guess um, 
I guess we had zero callers. Ramsey was uh, busy touching himself, as was our friend Anthony from Arizona. We uh, really, really do enjoy callers. I have uh, people tweet us a bunch. And, uh, yeah, whether, you know, if you're uh, listening to us on YouTube, definitely pound that subscribe button. Subscribe to us on iTunes. All those links are on the MAPodcast.com. Um, even with the YouTube comments, I try and reply to each one of those. I try to reply to our tweets as best as I can. So, yeah, tweet at us. Uh, call in our number, you know, just if you want to call in a future show, it's 213-457-3380. Uh, that'll be our number uh, from here on out. We had a different number our first couple months, but uh, since then we've had that same number, 213-457-3380. Uh, you can tweet us at the MMA Podcast. Visit our website, themmapodcast.com. We uh, do our show every Wednesday, 9 to 11 Eastern. We do a roundtable show every Thursday from, uh, from Jesus Christ, what, 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern uh, for Pacific. Just sub- subtract three from all those numbers I just spit out. And then you actually do a hyperbole, and you take the inverse uh, fractal triangle, and then you divide that by zero, and you get the MMA podcast. I You're think welcome. a hyperbole is like an English term. I don't think that's a math word. I meant, I meant hyperbole. Sorry. Hyperbole. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> I guess. I have uh, fucking no idea. Um, yeah, you have, any, <laughs> you have any more uh, shout-outs before we uh, send it off? I certainly do. Shout-out to my mother, my close friends. And uh, the people that I associate myself with, you guys make this life worth living. And with the tragedy that uh, we faced you know, earlier on, Jake touched on that, it really makes you think about how precious this life is. So thank you to everyone that has been there for me. And uh, I look forward to continuing this uh, loving life. And I love you, and I love our listeners, man. <laughs> love you all. It's fucking beautiful. Yeah, our uh, listeners, thank you guys so much for uh, tuning in. We've, re- you know, I know it's probably getting so repetitive, you want to puke, but we really, really, really do appreciate the downloads and the support and the positivity we've gotten back from you guys uh, throughout the times. <laughs> Uh, Lenny Hart, we were going to have her on tonight, but unfortunately her friend uh, was recently admitted to a hospital, so definitely keep her and her friend in, in your yeah, thoughts. Yeah, much, much love to that person. Much love. Yeah, she's uh, cool as fuck. We've been going back and forth through through the uh, DMs, and uh, yeah, I guess uh, listen to the round table next Thursday, uh, the podcast every Wednesday, and uh, until next week, we gone. We gone. Look up to the sky, hide a little smile and amusement Never grown accustomed to losing, live and die for the